Sergeants, can you please start your recordings? PC has started. Cloud recording is underway. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Katowski, you're opening. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Higher Education. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Council member, you are mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I can do my shake away again. Good morning. I'm Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education, and I would like to welcome you all to our hearing on the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget, the fiscal 2021 preliminary mayor's management report, the fiscal 2021 through 2025 preliminary capital commitment plan, and the 10-year capital strategy for the City University of New York. We are joined by Matthew Sapienza, CUNY's Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer, Hector Batista, Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer, and Gwen Perlman, Director of Capital Budget facilities, planning, construction, and management. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I just wanna have an insert here about a significant figure in our history celebrating Women's History Month. That person is none other than Shirley Chisholm. 50 years ago, Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman to run for president. She said she ran because somebody had to do it first. In her book, The Good Fight, she says, I ran for the presidency despite hopeless odds to demonstrate the sheer will and refusal to accept the status quo. Ms. Chisholm spoke of the revolutionary possibilities of electoral politics. And when asked if more women, specifically black women, should become involved in electoral politics. She said, quote, yes, women in this country must become revolutionaries. We must refuse to accept the old, the traditional roles and stereotypes. Ms. Chisholm said, what made me decide to run for president was that I felt the time had come for a black person or a female person could and should be president of the United States of America, not only white males, and I decided somebody had to get it started. Again, citing Ms. Chisholm, I think it's quite well known that I don't enter most things with the blessings of any party. Anyone who's followed my political career knows that very, very keenly. I am the only unbought and unbossed politician, and I mean that literally. I think you've got to recognize that I'm not white, not male, and I'm not going to get the blessing of the power structure in this country. They knew I was not afraid to chart a new course in the history of this country. And I just wanted us to think about that as we look at the budget, as we understand all of the challenges that we have before us, and to say to us that we cannot be afraid to chart a new course. Coming back to the topic at hand. It has been my honor to sit as chair of this committee since fiscal 2015. And in those 11 and now 12 separate budget hearings, I have made clear just how important faculty and upper management diversity is, tuition increases, and those impacts on affordability and accessibility for students are, and child care supports and increases in the base aid from the state are. 
Today, I am re-emphasizing my position in these areas. I also need to hear from CUNY on what CUNY is doing to support CUNY's students during this historically trying time and in its and the world's history. Is CUNY implementing new approaches to partner students with good paid internships and jobs, for example? I'm very concerned about this present moment and the city and CUNY's taking its rightful position to ease the current economic and social pains for its students. And we know that CUNY has suffered losses, with faculty and students, and we want to make sure that the staff of all of those schools know that we send our prayers and support to them. In all of these issues, my concern is that the committee wants to see what will come down from the state in the enacted budget. CUNY requested that the base aid remain intact from last year, but didn't give a request for any increases from the state. Why? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. This matter is most distressing as any tuition increases this fall would have a compounding impact on our students with limited financial means of employment. And it is so difficult to attain as the industries are bottoming, bottoming out where students might have easily worked like restaurants. I want to know what the conversation with the administration has been to mitigate this potential increase. Before I get into questions, I will continue to discuss the budget from a broader vantage point. Specifically, CUNY's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget of $1.17 billion or 1.2 billion rounded up does not change much from fiscal 2021 adopted budget. As mentioned, there are items in the state's 2021-2022 executive budget that remain in question at this point in time, such as the state share of support for early child, care, early, early child care services and ASAP programming. The fiscal 2022 preliminary budget also does not include the council initiative support, such as funding for the Peter F. Vallone scholarships or the university's partnership of programs with other city agencies. We will, of course, want to discuss all of these things today. The council's approach to its preliminary budget hearing is to ensure that the city's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to all New Yorkers. While efficiency and performance have always been priorities of this body, today we plan to scrutinize the organization of the city's budget more closely. For CUNY, this means we will have a conversation again about the limited number of units of appropriation used to describe vast areas of the university's spending, particularly around the community colleges. We will also be taking a closer look at how CUNY organizes its approximately $629.7 billion capital commitment plan. Many city agencies, CUNY among them, develop plans that commit only a fraction of that amount. CUNY has been plan planning more carefully with OMB and their commitment rates have increased. Fiscal 2020's commitment rate was 45%, and that's given the last quarter's pause mandate on non-essential construction projects. In years prior, CUNY's commitment rates were as low as 11 or 36%. I look forward to learning more about how the university has rebounded from the pause of its capital projects and what issues or efficiencies have arisen. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank my staff, particularly Omawali Clay, who is now functioning and is my chief of staff, M. Indigo Washington, my director of legislation, Michelle Peregrine, finance analyst to the committee, Isha Wright, the unit head, Amy Briggs, counsel to the committee, and Chloe Rivera, senior policy analyst to the committee. I would like to at this time acknowledge the council members who have joined us 
We have Council Member, Council Member Alan Mazel, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Council Member Alika Ampri Samuel, Council Member uh, Rodriguez, Adonis Rodriguez, and as others join, I will acknowledge them also. Okay, at this time, I will turn it back to the host who will introduce the panel and, and swear them in. Thank you, Chair Barron. My name is Amy Briggs. I am counsel to the Committee on Higher Education, and I'll be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a few seconds delay before you are muted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will be calling up individuals in panels. Please listen for your name and I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now begin by calling on the following members of the administration to testify. Hector Batista, the Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer of CUNY. Matthew Sapienza, the Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer. And Gwen Perlman, Director of Capital Budget Facilities Planning, Construction and Management. I will deliver the oath to each of you. And after I will call upon each of you to test individually respond to the oath. So um, will you all please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Vice Chancellor Hector Batista. I do. Thank you. Senior Vice Chancellor Matthew Sapienza. I do. And Director of Capital Budgets Gwen Perlman. I do. Thank you. I will now call on Hector Batista to testify. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Barron. It's good to see you again and other members of the City Council of Higher Education Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the CUNY's January Operating and Capital Budget. I'm Hector Batista, Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer at the Senior University of New York. I'm joined this morning by University Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer Matthew Sapienza and Gwen Perlman, Director of our Capital Budget. It has, been a, it has been a year like no other one. I would like to share with you how CUNY was affected by the pandemic and how we responded. But first and foremost, CUNY has been deeply saddened by the loss of COVID-19 for many members of our community, including 22 staff members, 16 faculty, four students, and countless CUNY retirees and alumni. Mm -hmm. Among them were Alan Liu, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor of Facilities Planning Construction Management. Alan attended this preliminary hearing, budget hearing last year. Since Alan tragic passing, I have taken on the role of interim Vice Chancellor of Facilities. So my testimony will include a university-wide response to the pandemic and how facility and our facilities needs. City Vice Chancellor Matthew Sapiens will join me to speak about the operating budget. 2020 was a year that both demanded and inspired great determination and resourcefulness from our students, faculty, staff, and leaders. The coronavirus was largely distant concern when the year began, but soon gained grip on New York that forced CUNY to all but shut down its 25 campus on March 12th and quickly pivot to distant learning. By late, by late March, 95% of university's 50,000 courses sessions were shifted to in online instructions. We quickly realized that thousands of students lack the tools to participate in distant learning. So we purchased 33,000 laptops to make sure that we were set, safely distributing those students in need. We also provided 4,000 personal hotspots for those students who required enhanced Wi-Fi capabilities. This was just one part of the broad effort to help our students meet the academic, economic, and emotional challenge they face. In terms of the capital program, we've also been a very challenging year for us. Due to the public health and financial constraints, all construction early in the pandemic 
projects came to a stop with the exception of priority health and safety projects. During the last months, of, as more priority health and safety projects came, we received individual approvals to proceed. Recently, the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget provided a plan to return to normal process for releasing existing projects and allowing new ones to start. Thankfully, we have been able to restart the majority of those projects. One of the most critical issues affecting CUNY Capital Program is the age of our facilities. The university facility portfolio consists of 29 million square feet, 300 buildings across 25 campuses. The average building at CUNY is more than 50 years old, most of over 30 and some exceed 100. Two major changes to our capital program that came out of the pandemic. The need for higher air quality standards, and the recognition that we need to accelerate the IT improvement efforts. As a result, as a result of COVID-19, CUNY conducted nearly all classes online this past year. As we look ahead, safely returning in-person education this fall, CUNY continues to develop higher standards and approaches to building ventilation. We will also continue to access how best to incorporate recent public health lessons into the design and operations of our facilities. The capital plan outlined in the fiscal 22 budget request reflects those priorities. Designs of capital renewal projects will include new criteria to improve indoor quality of our buildings, the latest public health information to ensure the safety of our community. Potential projects include in installing more efficient air filter and ha air handling system in our buildings, installing ultraviolet lighting system in spaces where required, and increasing ventilation in certain locations, installing more advanced optimizing building management system to better control our air dampers to allow outside air into the interior space. We also plan to significantly improve our HAVSC system and air quality related projects across the university. As I mentioned earlier, the pandemic requires CUNY and other universities to sh quickly shift to remote teaching. CUNY is proud of this accomplishment, but now we also recognize the need to boldly transform the way we do business. Remote, remote learning, remote operations require reliable, flexible, user-friendly technology. We must continue to improve modernize our IT operations to be supportive of our business needs and involve our system to adapt to changing needs of our students, faculty, and staff. When it comes to IT, the university needs to be up to date with innovation that advances protect our mission. CUNY has been strategically investing in consolidating IT infrastructure for the last decade. This invest investment will enable CUNY to standardize service offering and reduce operational costs across 25 campuses citywide. CUNY's IT roadmap has identified four, four strategies that includes transitioning to the cloud solution, systems where available and practical to help the university continue to do the business. The benefit of this project include the ability to adapt to fast changing technology, to bring solutions to our end user quicker, and to offer features and functions that are expected, expect us, us to get us to the place we need to be as a higher institutional learning organization. Moving to the modern cloud solution will help us to replace paper, manual business process, digital workflows, centralized data is currently located across our university, manage external providers. We will do this work in three phases. Phase one, we will focus on human resource operations. Phase two and three will include finance, student management, and operations. I'm pleased to end on some high notes. The first project I'm happy to report is the expansion of the CUNY and the Heights. As you know, we increased the size of, of the center from 15,000 square feet to 30,000 square feet. This expansion will complete, will complete this spring and the center will be fully operation this fall 2021 semester. I'm also, I'm also very proud to uh, talk, to bring a project that's close and dear to the Chairwoman Barron's uh, heart. The daycare center of City College is completed and the chance is looking forward to inviting to a virtual ribbon cutting ceremony. We're very grateful to you, the entire higher education committee for your strong support City University of New York and our students. I will now invite Senior Vice Chancellor Matthew Sapienza to provide additional information on our fiscal conditions.
Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now call on Matthew Sapienza to testify. Thank you, and good morning, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. I am Matthew Sapienza, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to speak with you about the Mayor's Fiscal Year 2022 Preliminary Budget and its effect on the City University of New York. Chairperson Barron and members of the committee, we very much appreciate your strong and continuing advocacy for our students. As you know, the global pandemic has created severe shortfalls in the city's budget. CUNY's budget request for fiscal year 2022 takes into account the university's priorities as well as the current fiscal environment. Our focus is on responding to the pandemic and jumpstarting New York's economic resurgence. The initiatives for which we are seeking support include prioritizing student mental health, creating a nursing pipeline program, forging connections with private industry partners to create career pathways for our students, expanding the successful CUNY core internship program, and enhancing diversity within our full-time faculty ranks. We are also seeking crucial capital budget support to enhance our IT systems, the needs of which have come to the forefront due to the transition to online learning. The budget request is available on our website and we will ensure that members of this committee and city council finance staff receive electronic copies. Of course, our budget request and future outlook is predicated upon the assumption that there will be significant additional financial support from the federal government to New York State and New York City. We are optimistic that this assistance is forthcoming, but if not, then our outlook would change significantly. Now let me speak to the city's preliminary budget. While we are pleased for the funding for our mandatory cost, the budget also includes $77 million, a $77 million efficiencies target in fiscal year 22, which is $31 million higher than our current year efficiencies target. If this redu reduction were enacted, CUNY's community colleges would experience a 14% cut in city support since the pandemic began. We also had to absorb a one-time $20 million reduction in the last quarter of fiscal year 2020, when the coronavirus first began to negatively impact the city's finances. A reduction of this size would severely limit our community college's ability to provide the core sections and other vital supports that our students rely on in pursuit of their degrees. The administration's reduction plan also targets the incredibly successful ASAP program, which has more than doubled community college graduation rates and is being replicated in several other states. We also seek the council's help in restoring $1.7 million that was provided for remediation in the current fiscal year, $1 million for the food insecurity initiative, and $510,000 for our community college childcare centers in the FY22 city budget. In addition to reductions from our public funding partners, COVID-19 has caused other unprecedented stress on CUNY's finances. Specifically, community college enrollment has been negatively impacted. In the fall 2020 semester, student full-time equivalent enrollment decreased by 14% from the fall 2019 semester. This was a trend that was experienced statewide and nationwide at community colleges. We were grateful that enrollment at the senior colleges has been stable and that we have experienced increases at our graduate and professional institutions. However, overall, we are projecting $41 million less in tuition revenue than in the prior fiscal year. The university has frozen tuition rates at its community colleges for five consecutive years. We are also proud that two thirds of our full-time undergraduate resident students attend tuition free, thanks to generous financial aid support like the New York State Tuition Assistance Program, Excelsior Scholarships, and the City Council's Valone Merit Scholarships. We are grateful to this committee on higher education for continually securing resources for the Valone Merit Scholarships. We will ask for your advocacy again, as funding for this critical student support program was not included in the fiscal 22 preliminary budget. The university has taken several steps to assist students who have experienced financial challenges as a result of the pandemic. In addition to freezing tuition and fee rates for this academic year, in the spring, Chancellor Felix Matos Rodriguez established the Chancellor's Emergency Fund which has already generated more than $8 million and has allowed us to distribute emergency grants to more than 10,000 students. Individual colleges raised more than $8.6 million in addition, 
enabling them to help thousands more for a total of nearly $17 million in emergency relief funds from across the university. We were also among the first systems in the nation to disperse $118 million in student emergency grants that were funded by the Federal CARES Act. In the end, distributing nearly 200,000 grants averaging approximately $600. An additional $118 million in aid to students will be allocated shortly using the Federal Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriation Act funds, which was authorized in late December. The second half of the CARES Act funding, which also totals $118 million, is the institutional aid that will be allocated to campuses to help cover costs associated with changes to the delivery of instruction due to the coronavirus and to cover the college's revenue losses brought on by the pandemic. CUNY campuses have also received $14 million from the minority serving institution component of the CARES Act. We have developed a plan for the use of the total $133 million that is available which was approved by our Board of Trustees Fiscal Committee earlier in the week. Chairperson Barron and members of the committee, the university community deeply appreciates your con continued commitment to a high quality CUNY education, which is the vehicle that so many New Yorkers rely on for the path of upward mobility. And Chairperson Barron, I also wanna just say very quickly, we all appreciated your tribute at the beginning of your remarks to Shirley Chisholm and we want to point out how proud we are at CUNY that she is a CUNY alum, attended Brooklyn College. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Oh. Chair, would you like to share anything? Okay. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on um, Gwen Perlman. Um, I believe that our, that ends our testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panel uh, for your testimony. I did have a little technical glitch and uh, Mr. Sapienza, I didn't hear most of your testimony, but I pretty much have an idea of what it is that you've shared. Uh, if there's anything glaring that I don't question you about that's in your, quest in your testimony, I'm sure somebody will send me a note. But once again, thank you uh, for coming and participating. I do want to make a correction. I said the capital budget, and I said billions, I should have said 629.7 million. So I want to correct that on the record. And I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Moya, Lander, Lewis, and Gibson, and thank them for their participation. So to get to the questions, so, CUNY has a total proposed budget. Oh, and I also see we've been joined by council member Cumbo as well. Thank you. Uh, CUNY has a total proposed budget of 1.17 billion for, or approximately 1.2 billion for fiscal 2022. However, the fiscal 2022 financial plan includes no new needs for CUNY. That's shocking. And I would like for you to uh, explain, were there any new programs or additional funds requested by CUNY for fiscal 2022? So Councilwoman, I'm gonna let uh, Senior Vice Chancellor Massapi answer to respond to that. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, th thank you Chair Brown for the question. Yes, um, the university, um, we had our board approved fiscal 22 budget request in which we had, we identified new needs for things like prioritizing student mental health, creating a nursing pipeline program, enhancing our workforce development um, programs that we have at our, at our campuses uh, currently, helping fund um, our, our resource centers at our campuses, what used to be called our single stop um, centers. So, we had a variety of programs that we were looking to, um, we're looking for support for. So, you know, obviously disappointing that um, none were included in the preliminary budget, but um, we understand and that, um, you know, there are, there's fiscal stress now on, on the city's budget and we, we want to be good partners. Um, and we, we thought that our, our budget request reflected that, um, that reality of the current fiscal environment, but, um, but yes, unfortunately, none of them were included in the in the preliminary budget. 
proposal? Well, I, I would have thought that you would have at least put it in perhaps as a wish list so that if we were to get a windfall from some place and uh, if the administration said, well, we've got this extra money, what shall we do with it? You would have been uh, on that list of people who had some needs that were not perhaps uh, satisfied in the first go round. So uh, it might have been, you know, parenthetically or an addendum or by the way or in case of, but I certainly think that that would have been appropriate to, to do that. And in terms of uh, budgeting, when I first went to the assembly, uh, when we were doing the budget, the term savings, savings, savings came up. And being a newbie, I didn't quite understand that that meant cuts, cuts, cuts. So savings is the euphemistic way of saying that we're going to um, take away or reduce, eliminate things that had existed before. So uh, we're talking now about what, what uh, budget, budget people call savings. The majority of the budget actions seen in this plan are due to reductions or eliminations taken in fiscal 2022, totaling 49.3 million from six actions. So let's talk about a large programmatic cut to one of my favorite programs, ASAP. What are the needs for ASAP now? And was CUNY able to keep the ASAP program whole for fiscal 2021? And remember, the council have restored $34.3 million through negotiations with the admin and there had remained 20 million unrestored. So what is the status at this point for ASAP? Yeah, man. Thank you. So uh, thanks Chair Brown for raising that that uh, question and, and uh, pointing out the importance of the ASAP program. Um, and we're incredibly grateful to this committee and the entire city council for their advocacy and helping restore those cuts from last year. We were looking at a $54 million cut to ASAP um, in, during last year's adopted budget process. And we're very, very grateful for the council's um, tremendous support to get 34 million of that restored. So we had a $20 million cut to ASAP to begin the fiscal year, and we ended up cutting ASAP well, about- Let me just ask a quick question. Sure. Was that initially presented? Because as my colleagues on the budget negotiation team spoke with me, that was not initially presented to them in that manner. No, I, I understand that there was um, you know, a misunderstanding. Um, and, and, and it's a large misunderstanding. And yeah. it's quite annoying because the council took bold measures because they wanted to keep ASAP whole. So I, I need to understand how that, first of all, happened. And then how was it resolved? So uh, we ended up we we ended up cutting less than twenty million to ASAP because one of the things that we wanted to maintain about ASAP was the the original proposal that was in the mayor's executive budget for last year was that um, CUNY would not have a new cohort of incoming students for the fall twenty twenty semester and that was something that we felt very strongly um, would have a really negative impact on our community colleges and so we did. Um, have a new cohort for fall 2020. Um, the number of students that we had in ASAP this year was a little over 21,000, which was in line with what we've had in previous years. But we found savings elsewhere in the program to the tune of about $13 million, mostly from administrative costs. And most there were some savings that we were able to generate um, from going to distance learning. So we ended up cutting about 13 of the 20. And the other seven, um, we found other programs from, um, from which we were able to generate savings to, to make up for the difference. So we ended up reducing the ASAP um, budget by about $13 million overall this year. But the number of students served was about the same as the previous year. The number of students served was about the same. What about the, the level on the quality and the quantity of the services that, that make ASAP such a special program so effective that it's nationally recognized and replicated in many states? What about that level? Yeah, no, we, we feel that those services are still being provided. Like I said, we were able to find some savings. The same through. ratio as it had been previously to the same level? Yeah, we feel the ratios are, are, are similar, but obviously um, we, we, want to, we want to enhance ASAP. 
Um, as you pointed out, Chair Barron, ASAP is incredibly successful. It's more than doubled community college graduation rates. It's, it's a challenge that folks throughout the country have been trying to figure out. And CUNY was able to develop this ASAP program um, and have incredible outcomes. And as you pointed out, it's being replicated in other states. So this is something we should be investing more in and trying to figure out ways to get to get more students um, in this program. So um, we certainly, you know, don't are not supportive of reductions to the program, and would you know would like to see enhancements to the program. How can we have an assessment of the impact that this uh, 13, uh, 13 million dollars cut brought? How can we assess and determine rather than say, well, it appears or it seems as if, what can we do quantitatively to see what impact that reduction had on ASAP? Well, I think in the so short that we're term, not, you know. Yeah. No, no, I no, no. I, I totally get totally get the, the very good question. I think in the short term, we could work with our colleagues in the Office of Academic Affairs to um, get some data and some metrics about the services that students are being provided for this year and, and get it to the committee. And I think in the long term, you know, the data that we've been tracking very closely for ASAP in terms of retention and more importantly, most, most importantly, I should say graduation rates, um, you know, we hope that when this new cohort of students gets to the finish line, um, that those rates continue to be as strong as they have been for ASAP. But in the short term, we certainly can provide um, you and this committee with more information from our colleagues on the Office of Academic Affairs about the services that continue to be provided to students. Well, I, I, what is your proposal for 2022 for ASAP? We, we would like to keep the same level of students. We, we want to have another cohort of students for fall 2021. And how does that um, translate to dollars? Yeah, we, you know, there's a, the, the administration proposed a $10 million cut to ASAP for next year. That's, that's at the fiscal 22 preliminary budget. Um, we obviously don't want to see any cuts to the program. We want to keep the funding levels the same and if not to, to increase them to the prior levels to restore that original $13 million cut that we got in this year's budget. So yeah, we're planning to have a new cohort for fall 2021 and, and keep the level of students similar to what they, they were this year. That's our goal and that's what we'd, we'd like to do. So uh, for the record, you're saying you would like to at least uh, maintain what you had and look to restore what was uh, erroneously cut or tragically cut due to misinformation to the budget negotiating team at the outset. Correct. We would like those cuts to be restored. Okay. Uh, council discretionary funding. In fiscal 2021, the council added $28.9 million to CUNY's budget to support a variety of citywide and local initiatives. Uh, please update us on how programming is being executed during this pandemic. Hi, Matt. Yeah, so we, we um, continue to, um, to um, allocate and, and use those dollars. The, the largest component of that are the, the loan sco uh, scholarships, which again, we're really, really grateful to the council for, um, for continuing to support and, and to put back in the budget every year. I know that that funding is not included in the 22 budget as well. And so we're looking for restoration there. Um, about 27,000 students. It's nothing, it's nothing in the budget for the Valone scholarships? Nothing? For fiscal 22, there is, there is nothing in the budget for Valone scholarships at this point at, in the preliminary uh, financial plan. Okay. And I'm sorry, you were continuing? Oh, no, that's okay. That, yeah, we, we are projecting about 27,000 students will benefit from um, the Valone scholarships this year. Um, again, that's been incredibly successful for many years. Um, and, and so that even the pandemic has had no negative impact on that process in terms of getting funds out to the students. Um, and then the other, the, the next largest one that I think, you know, we, we are looking for, um, again, restoration is 1.7 million for the remediation program. Um, that program um, has been incredibly helpful to um, getting students who are coming out, uh, coming into our community colleges to get them the co-requisite courses they need 
um, so that they can get out of remediation and get into, into you know, degree seeking program. And so um, we're looking for, for that to be restored. And as you pointed out in your remarks, Chair Barron, at the beginning, 510,000 for our child care centers is incredibly important. And um, the state budget um, did not include 900 and 2,000 for our child care centers. Um, so between the 900,000 that we're currently short for on the state side and 510,000 on the city side, as, as of right now, we're looking for 1.4 million um, in restorations for our community college child care centers. And so we're hopeful on the state side that the assembly and Senate, our colleagues there will help us get that restored. And, and, um, and for you all at the city council level to help us once again, I know you've been very helpful for many years on this front with the child care center restoration for the community colleges. Okay, so so why did you put it up towards the target if you didn't want to cut it? And and the changes to ASAP, are they the result of the pandemic and not the cut? I mean, wouldn't it just be a little bit more targeted in that regard? So you know, was it who where where did that generate from? The the ASAP savings? Yes. Yeah, some of, some of them are administrative savings that we've been able to take reductions in the administrative um, application of ASAP, both at the central office and at our campuses. Um, and some of it was savings that we've had, again, through going to distance learning, but, but not much. I think more of it has been on the administrative side um, than on the supports that have been given to students. That, those, are still, those are still happening. If the pandemic had not occurred, would that cut still have occurred in terms of the, the degree to which you were able to cut ASAP? I'm trying to understand the, the genesis of where that came from. Or, or was it a mix? Yeah, we, well, you know, we, we had a $46.3 million cut to begin the fiscal year this year in fiscal 21. Um, and in addition to the city support being down by 46.3 million, we also had, as I mentioned earlier um, in, in my testimony, tuition revenue due to enrollment losses was down 41 million. And um, you know, the state budget, um, we, there, there was some um, you know, clarity that we were looking for in the state budget, which we now have. But in the state budget for the community colleges, we now have a 5% cut, which is $11.7 million. Plus, because our overall enrollment was down for the community colleges, even What's though state- number? What was that number that it was down? Um, it's, at the community college was down 14%. But because state aid is provided on a per FTE basis, even though the state base aid number remained the same, we lost $5.4 million just because our enrollment was down. So we lost 5.4 in state aid to enrollment, co enrollment costs. We had 11.7 million from, from a 5% state cut for the community colleges. We've had 41 million dollars in tuition revenue losses. And we had a $46.3 million cut from the city. So when you add all that up, we had a very, very big challenge at the beginning of this fiscal year and continue throughout the fiscal year. So um, it certainly wasn't our first choice to cut ASAP. We, we think, you know, we're incredibly proud of ASAP and we think it's an incredibly important program, um, not only to get students through to graduation in a more timely way, but also quite honestly, as a recruitment tool. We know that a lot of students want to come to CUNY, CUNY's community colleges because we have ASAP. So we certainly take no pleasure or, um, you know, we, we've, we certainly don't want to in any way at all cut ASAP. But when we had challenges to the level that we had um, from both, like I said, our, our, our public funding plus what we lost in tuition revenue due to enrollment, uh, we felt that this, you know, was, was the best of not some not very good choices. And so we decided to, to reduce ASAP by 13 million. I wish that CUNY would be more assertive or even aggressive in asking for money. Uh, I, I've been told that uh, the state does at times restore or give increases uh, to childcare uh, center, child centers and things of that nature. But again, uh, referring to the Bible, you have not because you ask not. And I would love to see CUNY be more uh, proactive uh, so that as we move through this budget crunch, people will know, well, CUNY wants something rather than being 
so accepting or perhaps passive and not putting up more of a struggle, not being more vocal in asking for uh, what it is that you need. Um, and in terms of the child care centers, how, how many are up and functioning? Are students able to leave their children, drop their children there for care and supervision at these child care centers? What is the status? I heard you say that finally, after perhaps five year delay, that the city college child care center is open. So what is the status of the child care centers? Are they all open and performing uh, in reduced in-person capacities? Uh, uh, yes, Councilwoman, uh, they, they are all um, uh, operating in, in, in reduced capacity. And um, in, in some cases in full capacity, depending on, on the campus and, and the activity in that particular campus, as, as you know, 95% uh, of our classes are um, on virtually. And uh, so depending on what, what activities in that particular campus, but yes, they are. So they're all functioning, uh, perhaps even at 100%, and they're all virtual or how many are virtual? How many are in person? What is the functioning uh, at those child care centers? I... No, the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, the child centers are all operating uh, in, in, in full capacity, uh, depending on what the use is in that particular campus, depending on the occupancy of that particular campus at any given time. Okay, let me rephrase it. Are there in person? Yes. Okay, and some are at full capacity in person. Others, can you tell us which ones, or if you don't have it now, let us know which ones are perhaps remote as well? Are there any that are both remote and in-person or are they all one or the other? Why don't we provide you that information so I, so I don't really misrepresent which ones are not, which ones are and which ones are not. Okay. And, and then how is that making a difference? Because it's hard for me to imagine a child in a setting for three-year-olds and two-year-olds actually getting a good program remotely. So how is that being justified? How are, and, and if, the pro, if, the, if the point and the objective was to have students be able to have their child cared for in a setting while they are studying, that's not happening with a three-year-old, four-year-old who wants their mom's attention and the mom is trying, the dad is trying to study. So have we looked at what that impact is, how that's impacting on students? Uh, if, if I understand your question correctly, are you saying uh, the students that are learning remotely, are we, are we looking on how to provide them with their child's, the children with uh, daycare? Is that what you're referring to? Or are you referring to those students who are arriving, who are attending the campuses? Um, what are we doing there? Yeah. Right, I'm talking about those who are who are at home students or on a digital platform remotely, who would normally have taken their child to a daycare center, child care center, but now that child is also in a remote setting, and that child is perhaps three or four. Do you have a distinction as to the ages that will be in person as opposed to perhaps older children that might be able to function a little more? successfully remotely. The only distinction is that if, if, if a student is attending a, a, co a course in person, then they're being, a, they're, they're, uh, they're being allowed to use the daycare center. If, they're, if it is convenient for them to be able to drop off the child uh, at our daycare center, then they could use our daycare center and then uh, go back and take their, their courses online. And for those who are remote? The same thing applies if you're able to get the child there uh, to, the, to the daycare center. Okay. I, I'm not framing my question appropriately because I'm trying to understand how it benefits a, a student parent to be able to have their child, to not have their child in person in a center 
and to now have the responsibility while they're, the student himself or herself is learning remotely, now also having to pay attention to a young child. I, what I'm trying to say is that if, if the student is able to get their child to one of the centers, then they could drop off their child and, and go back and take their courses remotely. Um, we don't have right now, uh, we don't have uh, programs that allows to provide childcare center remotely for a child, virtually. We do not. So then all of your childcare centers yes. have in person. Yes. Then I misunderstood what I thought you had said earlier. So they're all in person to whatever capacity. I right, thank you. That's why I've been back and forth. I didn't understand what you initially said. Thank you. Um, so en enrollment declines and, and tuition. Now, you know, since I've been here and my husband before, when he was here, we have said that CUNY should be tuition free. Uh, we're glad to hear that there are some movements or some initiatives looking at that, particularly in the Senate to looking at bringing that back. But in terms of where we are now, uh, this committee was informed that the fall 2020 enrollment for full-time equivalent students at community colleges was around 60,200 students. And the spring was around 44 students, a difference of approximately 16,000. Is this where the tuition shortfall is occurring? Yes, yes, mainly the, yeah. Go ahead, Matt. No, sorry, Hector, I'm sorry. No, 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 Yes, no, mainly that's where the, our tuition revenue shortfall of 41 million is emanating from, is from the enrollment loss, no question. And the loss that you're looking at, is it a greater concentration of fewer students in the community college level than in the senior college level? Yes, the community colleges for, full, for last semester, fall uh, 2020, community colleges were down overall about 14%. And it was interesting um, because as I mentioned in my testimony, it really was a nationwide trend and a statewide trend. Uh, the SUNY community colleges had similar losses. And you know, one of the interesting things about it is it really, um, you know, community college enrollment has been, you know, counter cyclical to the, uh, right. to the um, economy for many, many years when the, when, whenever New York has had high unemployment rates, community college enrollment usually has some really big enrollment spikes. Um, and the opposite happened this time. And again, it happened throughout the country. And it really, be, it was because of the, where the economic downturn, uh, what industries it affected and what communities it affected. And so community colleges were down 14%. Senior colleges um, were about flat overall. Um, and our, our graduate and professional schools, our master's programs had a nice increase, which was, which was helpful. Um, so the community colleges are the sector that we're definitely the most concerned about when it comes to enrollment. And, and I think from that, we can conclude that those at the lower income levels perhaps lost jobs and weren't even able to balance the two and three jobs that we know students sometimes juggle to be able to go to, um, to go to school. So with that understanding and with the new higher education emergency relief funds, that's going to add, uh, what is it, four, uh, 45.5 million, is that what it is? It's, oh, it's 455. 455, 455 million. So community colleges are expected to get 166 million of that. And, and since the description says that uh, it can be used for financial aid grants to students, for student support activities, for institutional costs, uh, including a loss of revenue and reimbursement for expense already uh, incurred and for technology costs, what is CUNY's position what are the plans? What's the discussion about this 166 million that's going to community colleges? Well, so the, the second round of federal stimulus that you're describing, Chair Brown, is 455 million. Yes. Um, what the legislation requires is that colleges and universities um, 
allocate at least the same amount of money for student emergency grants that they did under the CARES Act. So for CUNY colleges in total, that was $118.5 million. Right. Mm -hmm. So we will be allocating at least $118.5 million in student emergency grants out of this 155 million. And so again, we're, we're really pleased to um, have that provision in, in the bill and, and really pleased to be able to help our students in, in that way. Um, so, so those funds will be given out, and, you know, I said, like I said, at least 118.5 million. The remainder of the funds, um, we, need a, we need more clarity from the US Department of Education about um, the specifics of what those funds could be used for, what are the ground rules? Um, and I think we need more clarity on our budget situation. You know, we'll, as you pointed out earlier, we'll, the state is negotiating a budget um, that we are hopeful will be completed on or around April 1st. And so we want more clarity on that. We want more clarity on, on the city budget condition, th which we're discussing today, and also on our, on our enrollment level. So I think as we get more information from the U.S. Department of Ed on, on the ground rules of the second round of stimulus funding, plus our own fiscal situation starts to crystallize a little bit better, we'll be in a better position to make plans on, on the best use of the remaining funds um, on, from the federal government. And, and can I just add one other thing, uh, Councilwoman? Um, the Chancellor's Emergency Fund has also, funds, the Chancellor has raised uh, a, lot, a lot of money uh, to be able to um, give those students that are not eligible under the CARES Act, um, resources that are needed. So we're, we're trying to do everything that we can to make sure that all of our, as many of our students are covered. When do you have an idea or timeline for when that second round of money will be expected? And have you used up all the money from the first round? CARES fund, fun? yeah, the, the, the CARES funds we had, we had um, allocated $41 million previously, $5 million of which went for mental health supports for our, our students, $20 million went for IT investments, including we purchased 33,000 iPads and laptops, um, and about, uh, we spent, uh, I think we purchased about 4,000 personal hotspots. So that was $20 million. And then the other $16 million um, in the first round went for um, student refunds, um, wait, fee waivers, dorm refunds for our resident students. So that was the first, um, that was the first allocation of 41 million is those three categories, 20 for IT, 16 for student refunds, five for mental health. The remaining 92 million um, was part of our budget plan for the remainder of the fiscal year that our board of trustees fiscal committee just approved on Monday. Um, so we are gonna be allocating those funds to the colleges now um, and those will be used to cover, again, costs related to the coronavirus, costs of going to distance learning. And one of the things that we were really grateful for was that when the federal government um, uh, came out with the second round of stimulus, they said that any unused CARES funds could be used for lost revenue. And so um, a good portion of the, CARES, of the CARES funds that we're giving out now will go towards lost revenue, which will really help our campuses. Uh, couldn't CUNY, in fact, use all of this funding to restore programmatic cuts and, and the revenue shortfalls and still have money left to support students, about $60 million to support students, uh, uh, in additional support? I, unfortunately, it won't cover all of our, all of our shortfalls. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had some really steep, you know, reductions that we had to take and in addition, you know, there are shortfalls that are outside of our, you know, we call our tax levy budget that our colleges are, are experiencing as well. I, I mentioned dorms, you know, just a minute ago, but there's other things as well. Uh, you know, uh, most of our colleges have performing arts centers and they rent their facilities out to outside groups and they, and they, and they generate some, some revenues from that. They have bookstores and cafeterias. There are other revenues that they normally generate throughout the year that are outside of a tax levy budget that they rely on. That performing arts center revenue is pretty much down to zero for this fiscal year. I mean, some of our colleges, you know, made hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in revenue just from that alone. So um, there are some pretty significant shortfalls that our campuses are facing. But I think to your question, yes, that there will be some campuses that 
can use the funds for restorations. Um, and we, we hope that they can cover most of them at, at, at a lot of our campuses, but some campuses, I think the shortfalls are just too steep to be able to restore 100%. So are you talking about the 60 or the 100 and uh, which part of money are you talking about right now? I'm referring to just the, this initial CARES funding that we just allocated the remainder for. Um, we're hopeful that the second round of stimulus, once we get further guidance from the US Department of Ed, that some of that could be used for additional student supports above the 118 that we're gonna give out or additional investments. Um, but again, I think a lot of that will depend on what our overall fiscal situation is in terms of our state and city budgets and our enrollment levels, whether that those funds could be used for investment or they're going to have to go towards helping us out in terms of just managing through um, this uh, fiscal situation. Well, we, we are, you're in a very unique position, uh, very challenging as well. And the committee uh, requests a breakout of how CUNY is allocating all of these federal stimulus funding uh, to its community colleges. And we look forward to getting sure. that. And, and it was mentioned that the chancellor had an emergency relief grant. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about that? I know that some of it went, or perhaps all of it was given as grants to students, if you could give us the correct information for the record, please. Yeah, sure. so, oh, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead, go ahead, Matt, go ahead. All right, thank you. So the chancellor, um, the goal um, that the chancellor set was to um, get $10 million in commitments from uh, philanthropy through philanthropy and private fundraising. And I'm um, sure as all of you know, that who know our chancellor, he's, he's very convincing. <laughs> Um, and he's already generated to date. I mean, he, he announced the, this back in the spring when coronavirus first started, so it's less than a year, and um, we already have over $8 million um, and have given that money out to thousands of students, and I think it's over 9,000, about 9,100 students that have received grants um, to date. And one of, one of the really helpful things about this emergency grant is it is private money, and so we were able to help a lot of undocumented students. I think about half of the funds went to undocumented students because um, you know, there are challenges with helping undocumented students with public money, um, but privately raised money um, we can use. And so that's been a really helpful component of this um, as well. Um, and so we're really optimistic that and, we're gonna get to that $10 Matt, million dollar goal. And Matt, can we point out also that the CARES Act, uh, the first CARES Act did not allow us to give money to undocumented students. So. That's why the, the fundraising by the chancellor was particularly helpful. I mean, uh, as, as Matt, you know, sort of alluded, I mean, the chancellor is not only a very uh, convincing person, but a very, you know, charismatic person who was able to was talk to philanthropy in a way that uh, allowed them to be extremely supportive of, uh, of what we're trying to do in terms of helping some of our much needed students, which is the undocumented one. We, we hear that the new stimulus is going to allow, it's going to have some more flexibility. So we're hoping that we're able to, to do that, but the chancellor's fundraising still continues. Uh, a part of that philanthropy also was money uh, from the Mackenzie Scott, as well as the Mellon Foundation, if you would speak to that as well. Yeah, that th those, th those grants went to two particular, um, two, uh, the, the went to uh, two particular colleges, uh, BMCC and Lehman. Uh, right. each, each received uh, $30 million um, that is uh, for their use that is being, uh, so the presidents are working on uh, figuring out how to uh, use those resources. And then the Mellon Foundation money was, uh, the chancellor was able to raise that money that allowed, allowed him to to hire some additional adjuncts as part of the, uh, which I think Charlie to hire about 132 adjuncts, which uh, services about 4,700 uh, uh, students. Um, How many uh, adjuncts did you say that was? Uh, that, uh, 132, is that money? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, that Mellon Foundation also talks about addressing social and racial justice concerns. 
how is how is that goal going to be addressed by this money? What's the plan? Because you know, I've had CUNY before me on many hearings and we have not seen significant improvement in black faculty at higher management. So now that we have this grant and it specifically says that it's looking to address social and racial justice concerns, what is being done to meet that, to meet that uh, goal? So I'm gonna, and Matt could add if I, if I miss anything. First of all, it starts out with our chancellor being the first uh, person of color to lead the system. I, I think I'm the first COO to, uh, to be CEO of CUNY. And uh, he has made, you know, a real, um, his appointments have been extremely diverse uh, appointments. Uh, Alan Liu that unfortunately we lost because of the coronavirus is the first Asian vice chancellor in the system. So the chancellor is extremely committed to diversity and inclusion uh, throughout the system. In this budget, um, he, he has in, we have included about hiring about 80 uh, diverse faculty. Uh, did I get that number right, Matt? Correct, yes. And, and uh, obviously um, the chancellor is, 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 is working on, on really s signaling to the system the importance of making sure that our faculty is reflective of our, the students that we, we, we teach and is, 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 is something that he's uh, extremely uh, committed to. Um, both the, the chancellor and the provost are, are working on uh, putting together uh, a system-wide approach to, towards making sure that we're making an impact uh, when it comes to diversity and inclusion. But it really starts at the top. And I think he set the tone um, uh, and he's sending the message across the system. I think his, his appointments of, I think we're up to about seven or eight new presidents. They're all uh, extremely diverse, not only in gender, but also in ethnicity and so forth. So. I think that uh, you know he's he's definitely uh, demonstrating that through his leadership, and we'll be happy to provide you with uh, some information as we develop it. Okay, I'm going to be looking very closely because, as you may recall, at one of the hearings when I asked about CUNY's so-called master plan. There was not any type of continuity uh, from one four or five year plan to the next. There was not any assessment of the success or the challenges of the previous year's plan that would be addressed in the next one. So these isolated scattered kinds of um, presentations don't, they're unproductive. They're unproductive because we, we don't have any kind of longevity to be able to see how we're moving. It's just, I have to do this. It's a part of the plan, stick something here. That's how I see it. Put something in there to, to satisfy that requirement. Oh, okay, here's the next plan, put something there without looking back and reflecting and any kind of uh, co cohesive comprehensive plan. So I'll be interested to look to see how that's going to correct that situation which CUNY has had in the past. So in addition, there are unfunded public-private partnerships to support workforce development for CUNY students. And none of these are particularly unusual, but they are actually now, time, very timely now. So CUNY has a wealth of resources and access in ways that other city agencies do not. Do you feel that CUNY is maximizing all of these resources for its students? I mean, I, I think that uh, when it comes to workforce development, that is a, a high priority for our chancellor. Um, recently, as you probably read, the chancellor was invited by JP Morgan uh, to be part of the CEO um, council that is gonna allow for um, in, internship programs for uh, some of our students. He's made that, he made, he's made workforce development one of his priorities and something that he is uh, extremely committed to. Um, as you stated, um, CUNY does, um, has had, has the ability to, um, you know, tap into resources because of who we are. I think that now, uh, because the chancellor is, is really so focused on this, I think that all, 
all those um, initiatives are going to be, you know, more coordinated, um, so we could, you know, really make the impact that I think uh, both you, as the chair of the higher education and the, this committee, is really uh, asking of CUNY, and I think that we're um, it, it, it is a high priority for our chancellor. Okay, I have another set of questions that I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to pause to allow my colleagues to pose their questions. And I'll come back with additional questions after they pose their questions. It's been a while since we've been here, and I appreciate their patience. And I know they're anxious to get their questions posed. So let me just pose this last set of questions about the state budget issues, and then I'll give my colleagues an opportunity to quiz you. Uh, talking about community colleges base aid. So the governor's executive budget proposes to hold the base aid steady in fiscal 2022. But it is good to hear more details about CUNY on this issue. So what is the total base aid that the executive budget proposes for the community colleges? So the total base aid, uh, Chair Barron, um, for this fiscal year is $2,947 per student full-time equivalent at the community colleges. And um, the state executive budget for fiscal 22 proposes to keep that flat at $2,947. So but aren't they proposing a 5% reduction? So the 5% reduction um, for the four-year colleges continues into next year, but it does not for the community colleges. Um, however, one thing that's really important to, to know about the community college state funding for next year is that even though base aid is proposed to remain flat at $2,947, because of those community college enrollment losses that we've been talking about um, throughout this hearing, um, we're uh, due to our community colleges are, are projected to lose about $10.5 million in state funding next year just from enrollment losses, um, even if base aid remains flat. So one of the things that um, we proposed in our budget request is that um, just due to the pandemic, um, to keep the total amount of funding whole as it was in fiscal 21. So whatever the total amount is that we received, let us receive that total amount of fiscal 22 to help us get through um, this pandemic related enrollment loss. Um, and that's, so that's, that was part of our budget request for this year. Well, well we know that uh... CUNY relies on about 57% of its revenues coming from tuition and fees. I think for an institution to call itself a public institution and rely in the majority on students in, in, uh, in tuition fees and fees is unconscionable and a contradiction to saying that you're public. And as we look over the past 10 years, I think that the trajectory will show that it's been over the past 10 years, an increase in tuition for community colleges of 33% from what it was 10 years ago and 35% for senior colleges from what it was 10 years. And certainly uh, that's, that's the undoing of a strong foundation it does indeed limit access. I know CUNY loves to tell us about the percentage of students who graduate without student loan debt, but there's another category of children of students who are not graduating. They're dropping out or stopping off. And, and that's not in that uh, number that CUNY loves to propose, uh, purport to us. Chair, yeah. ba Chair, Chair Barnett, I kind of, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanna, um, put on the record because I, I didn't recognize that number that you had cited. And I just want to say that in terms of our overall operating budget, the amount of money of our $3.7 billion operating budget, the amount of money that comes from out-of-pocket tuition payments from students is about 17%. So 83% comes from state, city funding, and, and public financial aid programs like TAP, Pell, um, Excelsior and Valone scholarships. So about 17% of our total budget, um, operating budget comes from out-of-pocket student payments. So well, I'll need to get some clarification on that because the information that I have says that the FY 2022 budget includes 720 
4.9 in revenues from four sources. It says interest city is 13.5 million, non-governmental uh, grants is 13.2 million, um, 39, 39% total 283.1 million is from state grants and charge for services is 415 million. Yeah, we're, we're, we're happy to provide the breakout of that, Ms. Chair Brown. One, one thing to, to keep in mind about the, the numbers that the city includes in their plan for tuition revenue, that tuition revenue includes funds that come from the state for TAP and funds that come from the federal government through Pell that students use for tuition. So the, the metric that we like to look at is how much of our budget is coming from out-of-pocket student payments. And that number is about 17%, but we're happy to provide the data and breakout for you for senior colleges and community colleges as well. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, next question. Did CUNY ask the state for an increase in the base aid? Why or why not? Our budget request did not include an increase in the state aid. Um, it asked to keep us whole for this year. Um, and our, part of our whole budget request was we were trying to, trying to recognize by both the state and the city levels, um, the unprecedented financial crisis that's been brought on by this pandemic. So um, we were trying to be good partners and, um, and wanted our budget request to reflect that. So we didn't, um, specifically asked for an increase in, in the base aid rate, but asked that we be kept whole so that our colleges wouldn't be negatively affected by the enrollment loss. Thank you. The governor is also permitting CUNY to sell off any underutilized real estate to backfill revenue shortfalls from the state. And the committee learned that the state has withheld 20% of its operating support for fiscal 2021, and it released all but 5% leaving CUNY with an approximate $12 million cut. Is this the shortfall total? I'm not sure what, what you're referencing, but um, let, let me, uh, on, in terms of the, um, the uh, disposition of property, um, the, there's no such mandate. What we're, what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're uh, conducting an analysis of all our real estate to try to maximize our real estate. Um, in some cases to allow us to uh, move from rental where it's really affecting our operating budget. Um, we've been able to reduce our, uh, our rental uh, just to give you a sense. Uh, uh, we, we've been able to reduce it from like 18% to 60% to 6 under this, under this uh, this chancellor, and the idea really is to try to uh, move move some of our um, some of our um, programs into space that we own. So we're doing an analysis of all our properties to determine where there's might be opportunity not only to put in more program, but also see if we could bring in some additional resources uh, to allow the you know the university uh, to invest in in us in our in our students and our, and our faculty and, and, and our programs. Um, we are, right now we have one, one particular project that we're sort of uh, looking at, which is uh, the North Hall project, which is connected to uh, John Jay, where we did an RFEI, a request for interest, where we you know, just went out to the marketplace to really understand what the, what, what the uh, appetite is for, the, for, the, for, for this particular site. And the idea behind it is to try to figure out how we could uh, probably uh, be able to move one of our junior, one of our two, one of our two-year schools, uh, uh, and uh, provide some additional space for uh, John Jay and, and some of the. So um, right now, it's just um, just gathering information, but uh, we have not been mandated to dispose of any of our property. But you're considering it. But it's not it's not disposing of our property. It's to using our property to to bring in uh, to move some of our programming to those and, and get us out of the business of the rental business, right? Be which is creating an impact on our operating budget. 
Okay, so you're not considering selling any of CUNY's assets. Let me be, let me be, uh, we are looking to maximize our, our real estate. Right, I understand. And the, I, and the way, the way we, the way we want to move from rental and find other space to bring uh, those programs into property and space that CUNY owns. Correct. So my question to you is, so you're not considering selling any of your assets? Because my question was going to be, if you were considering selling, do you have a target dollar amount that you're looking to uh, reach? All I can say is everything is on the table. We don't have a targeted amount that we're trying okay. to reach, but the, the, main, the main criteria in all of this is how we can make, uh, move some of our existing operational um, programs into these facilities. And if that is through a partnership with the public sector, then it's a partnership with the public sector where some additional uh, revenues are met and we, and we satisfy our operational needs. Thank you. At this point, I'm gonna give it back to our moderator, Ms. Briggs, and she will continue on our hearing today. Thank you, Chair Barron. I will now call on council members with questions in the orders they raised. They use the raise hand function in Zoom. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the raise hand function in Zoom, please do so now. Also, please remember to keep your questions and answers to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will maintain a clock and a member of our staff will unmute you. You may begin after I call on you and the Sergeant gives you a cue. We, we will now hear questions from Council Member Rosenthal and Council Member Landers. Um, let's begin with, I will now call on Council Member Rosenthal to test, to ask her questions. Thank you so much. Um, Chair Barron, I, I, I was watching you in awe answering these questions, asking these questions and understanding the answers. To me, the last 20 minutes or 30 minutes has been like, you know, one of those word clouds where it's just words everywhere. It, to me, it sort of felt like just numbers everywhere and I couldn't quite tell what's coming and going. Um, but so, so all of which to say, um, apologies if I'm repeating some of the questions. Um, Chair Barron just, I think, hit all of mine. But I, I if I'm so apologies if I'm repeating. Um, uh, I and I really appreciate the way that she was asking them. Uh, so I just want to double check. It sounds like for the second slug of money from the federal government, um, there's a requirement that you give as much in student emergency grants as you gave in the CARES Act. It, did I hear that right? That's correct. Can you, can you give more? Yes. So it's not a limit. Correct. It's that's the minimum. That's the floor, not the okay. ceiling. <laughs> yes. And then I'm trying to piece out uh, the remaining bit that you um, did, that's not the 118. Um, and I think Council Member Barron got through all of it. Uh, there was one that went really fast for me. 13 million in administrative savings. I, and I wanted you to, I wanted to know if that included cuts to any faculty, whether it be adjunct or re regular, like what does administrative cuts mean? Yeah, uh, thank you, Councilman Rosenthal for the question. And that 13 million referred to the cuts that we've made in the ASAP program for this year. Um, and right. so most, most of that came from administrative costs in the ASAP. I, I would have to get back to the committee in terms of the total faculty that were in the ASAP program versus this year. I'm not sure if, um, if there's been any reductions in the faculty levels, um, yeah, but I believe I mean, that most 13, of it's come from administrative costs. What is, but just is administrative costs mean um, less paperwork? Does, I mean, it's, uh, I just don't, 
13 million sounds like a big number in the scheme of things. Um, I, I yeah. maybe uh, Council Member Barron will follow up, or if you could give the details to um, the committee staff, that'd be great. You know, fundamentally, I'm concerned about two things. One, that we restore the ASAP program to 100% of where it was. And I, again, I just couldn't quite follow all y'all. Are we there yet or not? And second of all, I'm wondering if you can use this money to restore the cuts to, to adjunct faculty who had been promised to become full tenured faculty but that you distributed that cut to all the colleges and then asked them to implement it. But I am interested in the total for adjuncts and wondering if part of what you're giving back to the colleges is money to restore those adjunct positions. So the, the original CARES Act um, that was signed into law back in March um, had very, very specific uses for those funds. Um, and so um, couldn't use any of those funds really to, um, you know, for the purposes that, that you're describing. Um, for the second wait, round- wait, 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 just one second, real clearly, real quickly. Sure. Um, I would guess that restoring the adjunct positions could be in the category of um, restorations because we had to make these cuts due to COVID. No? I could be yeah. making that up. Well, but you well, know what I, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, and we are optimistic that the second, and back up, we, we are pleased that the second round of stimulus, um, that it appears that um, they are allowing more flexible uses with this round than they did with CARES. And so we're optimistic that once, we get, for, once oh. we get further clarity from the US Department of Ed about the specific uses that um, we'll be able to include more categories and more restorations than we were under CARES. Um, if I may, just for one second, um, the, a couple of things. Um, Chair, may I have just a few more minutes? Okay, certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so my understanding of the CARES Act is that it requires payroll to stay the same. It, re it requires institutions to do, uh, I think the exact words are, if I have it correct, is to the extent practicable, um, keep their payroll the same. And um, while um, the number of adjuncts that we had did go down from the year before. Just to want to also point out that um, the number of full-time employees, we, we have not let go or done, uh, other than our vacancy um, review board in which, you know, we do have a hiring freeze, but we haven't, um, you know, laid off full-time people um, or accessed any full-time people. Um, we have non-reappointed some adjuncts, but, you um, so yeah. we feel that no, to I the extent practicable, we have kept, yeah, to, yeah. yeah. For, I with, mean, I with appreciate the, keeping faculty. That's good. Adjuncts also, you know, provide a critical, you know, added value to the, to the colleges and the students. No question. We greatly value our adjuncts and um, we were glad that, um, I think it was almost 700 adjuncts that were non reappointed back in June were brought back. Um, so we were pleased about that. Um, you know, our enrollment levels overall are down and that has an impact too um, on the, the, the number of adjuncts that are needed, but we greatly value our adjuncts. And, and I think that, that um, how much we value them was I think uh, you know, clear in the last contract that we settled with the faculty union back in October, 2019 with the, um, really unprecedented increase that adjuncts right. received. And in listen, and, and, and when I, I cut you off, it's only because I'm watching Council Member Lander, who's eager to jump in here, which is totally cool. And I know Council Member Barron wants to get back, so I apologize. No, 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 it's fine. I mean, I'm using extra time, and that's why I might cut you off. It's nothing, I really mean no disrespect. I, I mean, again,
again, I feel like I'm in this word bubble of numbers bubble, just things going around, you know, 2000 adjuncts were laid off. They, they weren't so, laid off though, Councilwoman. They were, they were just not reappointed. And so oh, I think that's, okay. they that's were a distinction. They reappointed. And, and, I mean, and, and, again, and can, I, can, I, um, but can I, can I just put in some perspective though? Well, I mean, hang I, on one second, because I don't want to be lost in the word or numbers bubble. Sure. So be, you know, I'm gonna, if you wanna present it, that they were just not rehired, that's your prerogative. I'm gonna present it as fired. So okay. just two different, just two different ways of thinking about the same coin. Um, but one way or another, 2000 minus 700 is 1300 who were not reappointed. Am I wrong? It, you're not wrong, but I think the other thing, let's put it into some perspective. I mean, I think that in 2019, just to use an example, we, we didn't reappoint about 1,800, right? So um, depending on where we are with our budget situation, I mean, those, those and how many sessions we need and, and all that, we, that's how those determinations are made. So you know, and, the pandemic- and I guess My takeaway thought from it is that the more transparency you have, the less will be stuck in back and forth dialogues like this. And the questions come from a place of lack of transparency. So, you know, I would urge you to set the verbiage aside and really try to make sure that people understand why the numbers are changing. But, I want to get back to students and but I, I, I want to just minute. respond to the transparency part because I think that you know uh, under this chancellor we, we we're as transparent as as we could be uh, under the and the information that we have right um, well, just so you know sir yesterday the OMB director said he was doing the best he can so I get that line and we're okay. all doing the best we can okay. so I'm, I'm not throwing shade I, okay. I'm asking us to work differently, work work differently. Um, and, but I do wanna hear about ASAP. Um, where, where are you at the number of ASAP uh, um, grants you're giving out? Um, we are about tw a little over 21,000 students that are in the ASAP program this academic year. This academic year starting September, 2020. And in September 2019, what was the number? It was, it was around the same. Around the same, 21,000. Mm -hmm. yes. And so right now, what are you projecting for uh, September 2021? What number is in the budget? We would, like to, we would like to keep the same level, but a challenge that we're having for right now for keeping that level is the city's preliminary budget includes an additional $10 million cut for ASAP. So of that $10 million cut- for ASAP? Specifically for ASAP, correct. So the governor so that 10 is specifically mil saying, I'm gonna no, take the, 10 million in, out. In the mayor's preliminary budget. Oh, in the mayor's, oh yeah. yeah $10 okay. million dollar reduction. So um, if that $10 million reduction remains in the city's adopted budget in June, um, I got gotcha. you. And is there, a, I mean, and, and I'll fight as hard as I did last year to get it you. restored. And that was, you know, the budget negotiating team really went to bat for that. And I'm so proud of Speaker Johnson for his leadership on that. And we're, That's and why that we're, all, we're all greatly appreciative. Right. Thank but um, so is there, just given the fiscal crisis, given that you're going to get a second bucket of, bucket of money, is there any um possibility that money 10 million could be used for asap is that in the cards at all i think it depends on the clarity that we get from the u.s department of ed they haven't uh promulgated um their faqs or given us the full guidance that they did under cares yet it's coming and so we're hoping to get that soon so i, I think it could depends you have but used could under the clarity you got from the first CARES Act, could you have used that money for ASAP? No, no. 
but you gave 118 million in student emergency grants. I guess emergency but, but, grants is different. But, than but, but, yeah, I mean, right. The the emergency grants under CARES right, had to you. had to go directly into the students' pockets. Yeah. Um, and ASAP is an academic program. ASAP pays for faculty and space and advisors and textbooks and metro cards. ASAP covers all those costs. Um, so hypothetically, you could say if you if the uh, act says, you know, what were the words? It was like you're you're keeping people on payroll. Then that's how it would be allowed to be yeah. financed, right? We're hopeful. We're hopeful that when we receive the the um, the the further guidance, that the fact that this bill allowed for more flexibility than the CARES did that um, we'll, there'll be um, things that we weren't able to cover in CARES that we'll be able to cover with the second Okay, sentence. last question. So, um, of course, two parts. One is, what's the total amount you're expecting in the second tranche? And what are your top two pri funding priorities once you get that where there's latitude? So the total amount in the second stimulus was for university-wide was $455 million, of which, as you pointed out earlier, uh, Councilmember Roosevelt, we have to spend at least $118 million in additional student emergency grants. So that leaves $337 million. Okay, because that entire 435 goes to you, goes to CUNY. It, it goes to the colleges. There, there's an okay, amount for checking. every single college that's lined out in the federal bill. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. And what was the total of the of the first? The Give cares me. was the cares was 236 million, which was okay. 118 in student emergency grants and so 118 it's much for institutions. Increasing by 200 million. Correct. So, what would be the top two priorities for funding of that additional? It, barring, you know where your hands are tied. I, I think, um, you know, we, we want to have a very student centric plan and use the money in a way that's going to help students, whether that's additional emergency grants or like we did with CARES, additional mental health services. I think we want to be, we want to have a very student centric plan for the federal, uh, second round of federal support. When are you going to make it, these decisions? Um, when it's, I think when we get more clarity from not only the federal government, but but we get more clarity on what our overall fiscal situation is that in both from Albany and here and down in the city, um, when okay. our budget situation crystallizes um, and we get further guidance, we'll be in a better position Look, to make I, I'm to put happy together to a plan. Follow Corey Johnson's lead on fighting again for ASAP, but. Um, but we're all in a rough spot. Um, I think for the city's budget, it's coming back in a couple of years. And I think that I would hope that another administration would pick this up 100%, if not more. But I don't think, well, I would hope, again, that if the CARES, if, if the second stimulus can cover that $10 million shortfall, I think you could have a negotiating agreement with the mayor's office that that money would be restored as soon as the stimulus runs out. My two cents, um, only because I fully support it. Or you could say, should the city spend that 10 million on ASAP, you're willing this year because of the additional stimulus to double that number, right? or to add an additional 10 million. I mean, 200 million is a lot of money. All right, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. I will now call on Council Member Lander. Thank you, Chair Barron, for convening this hearing as always. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor Sapienza and uh, Mr. Batista. it's good to have you here. I really do appreciate deeply the work that CUNY has been doing through this pandemic. I will start by saying I do think on the city budget that it is unconscionable that the city budget cuts funding designated for CUNY by $40 million while increasing funding for the NYPD by almost $200 million. 
um, that's having our priorities backwards. So uh, I will fight hard to make sure we, we make that right, restore not just the ASAP 10 million, but the other 30 million that, you know, that, that is, and what, the New York City that the mayor proposes to cut from CUNY while increasing funding for policing by nearly $200 million. So I will be fighting there. Um, I do wanna uh, further what the chair have said and council member Rosenthal said about the adjuncts. I will say that um, you know, in recent years, while you've made a good agreement to raise their pay and hire more full-time faculty, adjuncts do more and more of the, of the work at CUNY. We've come to rely on them more and more. So it isn't right to treat it as though non-reappointment is different from laying them off. They're relying on that for their salaries, their students are relying on them, their schools are relying on them, and, and they are in a pandemic. So without looking backwards, like you made the decision you made, I just wanna be, make sure I understand it. You have $92 million uh, that we think is coming in this next tranche of CARES Act funding and it would cost $30 million to, to rehire, to reinstate those 2,000 adjuncts. Do I have the numbers right? 92 was the remaining amount of CARES funds that hadn't been allocated, which we are now allocating to the campuses in this fiscal year. Okay, Correct. and $30 million of that would be sufficient to restore the 2,000 adjuncts that, that I'm gonna say were laid off and that you were saying were not reappointed, but either way don't have their income. Is that right? You can. I, you know, I believe I, I'm not 100 percent sure on that number, but it's it sounds to be in the ballpark. Yes. Okay. So um, it seems pretty clear to me that you should use 30 million dollars of the 92 million dollars in CARES Act money to rehire the 2,000 adjuncts that you laid off, and it sounds like you're waiting to make sure that's a permissible use. But if 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 it's a permissible use, will you commit to do it? I, I think that there are, there are so many other variables that have to be weighed before we can develop a plan for the second round of federal stimulus funds. And um, it's our budget situation from both the state and the city. Um, it's our, the needs of our students. And it's also enrollment levels. Um, how, you know, what, if, it, if our enrollment is going to continue to decline, what is the level, total number of adjuncts that we need to serve the students? Um, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of factors. I, I don't think it's, you know, all right. I don't want to, I don't think you can look at it in, 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 you know, without the context. Well, all right. I don't want to argue with you about this because we clearly disagree on it. The context matters. What you're going to do going forward matters. I'm going to get to some ideas for new revenue. Um, all of it matters. But the care, the whole idea of stimulus funding in very large part for employers, this was true with the PPP. This was true, like the idea of providing institutions with substantial relief support was so they could make sure their employees had the resources they needed to survive the pandemic. This is not about CUNY. I mean, I care about CUNY's long-term plan and what's the right number of faculty and what's the resources you need and where does that money come from? And all that is, matters enormously, but the CARES Act money is to make people whole during the pandemic. And you got 2000 workers who, and you, you, know, you had to make hard decisions. So I understand, I, I might not have agreed, but I understand why you laid them off during the pandemic. But isn't this the relief money that employers are supposed to use to keep their employees whole through the pandemic suffering? Uh, it, it's for a lot of uses. It's, it's for um, you but, know, the cost to go to distance learning. It's for the costs of um, us having to buy PPEs. It's for so student immersion. There's a lot of so, uses. So I agree you're, you're describing, so, but, but that's different. I mean, if you're saying there are other backward unfunded uses, you know, like PPE and like distance learning costs, concrete increases required by the pandemic, uh, okay. But are, are you saying there's more than $92 million of very specific pandemic cuts like the laid off adjuncts separate from the broader question? This is why I feel frustrated with the, there are many questions around city and state, the budget the looking forward questions that are urgent. But this funding is to fill pandemic loss um, and pandemic in lo loss for adjuncts is quite real. Um, obviously, uh, you know, other CUNY losses should be covered, but they, the, the adjuncts should not have their income sacrificed by forward looking budget balance if we have CARES Act funding to, funding to cover it. 
Uh, Council Member, let, let, let me jump in. Let, let me jump in. I mean, I think I think my colleague Mr. Sapiens is trying to give you as, as good an answer as we can right now. Uh, the university right now is trying to figure out what our funding partners are going to do, not only at the city level, at the state level. As, uh, as we stated, we have uh, enrollment is down 14% uh, uh, at the two-year schools. Enrollment is down across the university. The only, the only area that we're seeing some, some growth in enrollment is at the graduate center, right? Uh, and so because of all of that, because we have additional cut, um, expenses that we, um, because of the pandemic, we had to take on like $75 million worth of uh, uh, expenses connected to PPE and, and facilities and, and sort of all those things, buying um, laptops for our students to make sure that they could do, you know, do more learning. And, and as I stated in my opening testimony, my is to allow, all these things are factor in into the, and right now we just don't know what our budget, our, our situation. We have a lot of you know, colleges, Time has expired. Chair, can I can I get a few more minutes? We we have yes, a lot of yes. a lot of our colleges that do not um, that are, you know, from a financial point of view, are are struggling financially, and we're trying to use the CARES Act the best way that we can to make sure that we continue to do the work that we're doing. We we could you could use layoffs. We say not reappointment. I want to point out, 2019 pre pandemic. We didn't reappoint 1,800 uh, adjuncts. After the pan pandemic, we didn't reappoint 2,700. The chancellor to, to private fundraising, uh, we, we brought back 656. Respectfully, respectfully I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna reclaim my, my time here. And I'm gonna, sure. uh, so, uh, uh, and I'm gonna make a request of you because I think you're really mixing two things up um, uh, in ways that are not helpful for this for this hearing. Okay. So, so first, the CARES Act funding was in very large part, and you can go look at the language if you need me to, to point it out to you, I'll look at it. It's in section 18006 of the CARES Act. It's, it, the people that you did not reappoint, they still needed to pay their rent, they still needed to buy food, they, and, and the point of the CARES Act funding in large measure was to make sure that workers whose employers lost money were able to live. And so that's how the PPP worked. That's how the CARES Act worked. Now, there are other CARES Act expenses and I respect the need to buy the laptops and the PPE. So I would be very glad to see the first act CARES Act money at budget and the second CARES Act money budget and your list of expenditures that are narrowly about pandemic loss. Expenditures you had from the pandemic um, but as you start to transition that into register decline and long-term questions about CUNY's budget balance, that is not, that in my mind does not come uh, as a use of CARES Act funding before making workers whole. It's critical for this council. I'm going to fight tooth and nail to get the 40 million restored and get you more money. I want to ask in a minute about looking at a pilot from NYU and Columbia. I want to have the Invest in New York Act so that the millionaires and billionaires are paying more in taxes so we can fund our CUNY and SUNY schools. But we should not tell these laid off workers that they stand in line behind all those forward looking budget issues for CARES Act funding. So I've made my point, we, we disagree about it, but I guess what I would appreciate if you would provide the committee and the chair is a real clear itemization of what you guys are claiming is CARES Act appropriate funding, money that you spent on specific things like laptops for distance learning, on PPE for your schools, and on this, on like, you know, replacing income for faculty that was, re we'll just call it reduced. Let's find a word so we don't have to fight over whether it's reappointed or laid off. If you would give that to us so we could understand it, I think that would help. Um, there's two more, uh, hopefully quick, uh, quick questions, because I don't think, at least on the first one, we're gonna disagree. But I was very intrigued to see uh, just a month or two ago that the University of Pennsylvania announced a voluntary pilot for the folks who don't know UPenn is a private school, even though it, you know, it sounds like a, a public one. Um, they're gonna do a hundred million dollar pilot to support Philadelphia public schools. It's becoming an increasing practice for private universities uh, to pay a payment in lieu of taxes, whether uh, adopted by state law or done through a voluntary agreement. Um, 
NYU and Columbia don't do anything like that currently with CUNY and the city loses, you know, foregoes almost a half billion dollars in revenue uh, from property tax loss from higher ed institutions and some other uh, nonprofit institutions. Columbia is the second largest landowner in the city of New York after New York City. Um, at least by my calculations, it has more property than the Catholic Church, which is quite a lot of property. Uh, have you guys explored either directly with Columbia and NYU or through the state legislature in some you know, legislative approach, um, uh, something modeled on what Penn is doing, a pilot approach through which uh, Columbia and NYU would help in supporting CUNY? Yeah, um, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. So I'd like to you know, sort of look into it and uh, be able to come back to you and, and, and give you a, sort of a more thorough response. Okay, that's great. I would like to work on and it. And if you could I'm, send me what you have, that would be really great. I'm really going to send you what I have. And just for purposes of the record, I'm going to give put a few stats out here. So they're on beyond this public record. And then I'd like to follow up with you uh, separately sure. because it's really quite remarkable. You know, I was looking just at the social mobility index ranking. Uh, six of the top 10 slots on the social mobility index ranking are CUNY schools. That's incredible. I mean, when Very we proud. say CUNY is a vehicle of upward social mobility, that was amazing. Either of you want to venture to guess where NYU and Columbia are on the list? No. Columbia is 1,303rd and uh, NYU, excuse me, is 1,303rd and Columbia is behind them at 1,363rd. And I don't mean to disparage them. They are marvelous institutions, but you have six of the top 10 for upward social mobility. And it just plays out time and time again, you know, your tuition is, you know, I, we want it to be zero, but it's seven thousand dollars in state. Theirs is fifty or sixty thousand. Your average family income is forty thousand. Theirs is a hundred and forty or a hundred and fifty thousand. They have endowments of four and ten billion dollars, respectively. Do you have any endowment at all? We um, do. But uh, not, not anywhere close to that. Number. Not anywhere close to that. <laughs> and Chair, I know this is an issue close to your heart, but if you look at the percentage of students that are Black and Latino at CUNY, you know, it's, it's in the, you know, 20 to 40 percent of each Black and Latino students at NYU and Columbia, there are five and six percent black and eight and 11 percent Latino. So the idea that our city is foregoing hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenue for NYU and Columbia, when we can't, when we're cutting CUNY by forty million dollars, it just makes no sense. So I look forward to exploring the details with you. There are places where this is done through state legislation. There's places where it's done through voluntary agreement. Um, this is the time we we should do it. So um, thank you for your willingness to explore it with us. Um, you know, we gotta work out the CARES Act funding, but then we need to achieve some long-term revenue to support CUNY in this amazing work that you do. And, and we wanna find you know, city funding to do it, state funding to do it, and new sources uh, to support it. My last question at the, ch at the chair convened a hearing um, just two or, two or three weeks ago with Hunter College on the question of Hunter College uh, high school admissions. Um, and at that time, the representative of Hunter College, uh, I asked, we'll be having our budget hearing in just a couple of weeks. And as we're, you know, a chunk of the budget money that the city provides to CUNY goes for the Hunter College uh, High School. And so as we are looking at, at providing that money this year, we want to understand what is the admissions process for next year's admissions, knowing that other selective schools around the country have cancel their tests and are adopting approaches more uh, achieving of the diversity of our city. So do you, could, are you prepared with the answer for what, what um, the Hunter College High School admissions plan for next fall is? Uh, not at this time, uh, council member, but uh, we obviously um, uh, thank you for your always continued support of uh, CUNY. And, and as you stated, uh, you know, we're very proud of uh, the upper mobility, but we will uh, be able to come back to this council and, and be able to answer that question uh, right now where the chancellor is. Uh, I mean, the, 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 um, the president of uh, Hunter Schools is, is, is obviously working on that and we will be able to come back to you with, uh, 
with an answer to that question. Uh, All but right. I'm uh, continue uh, thanking you for your support and look forward to hearing from you on, on, on this pilot. On the, on the pilot, I look forward to following up. I do need to express disappointment on that answer on Hunter because, and it wasn't you who were here, it was the Hunter College admissions representative, but she promised that there'd be an answer by the time of the preliminary budget hearing. And this is the preliminary budget hearing. Um, and you know those students and families, obviously everyone just needs to know what the admissions process is for the fall. But uh, you know, schools, you know, Boston, uh, Boston Latin, many of the selective high schools around the country have suspended their test. For all the great work you're doing with six of the top ten upward social mobility and how diverse CUNY is, if you look at those numbers at Hunter College High School, you will not be pleased with them. So it should be in the interest of CUNY's administration, as it is the chair who's been a champion on this and the students to get that fixed. So. Um, you know, I don't want to be in a place when the funding, uh, you know, when the budget comes around and we're talking about terms and conditions to be having to push on, you know, making a term and condition of CUNY's funding, uh, uh, you know, real steps forward on diversity and admissions. But, you know, that's, you know, we're going to have to do that this year if we don't get a lot further forward than we are pretty quickly. Uh, thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I just want to echo uh, what my colleague has said in all of his uh, presentation has saved he and council member Rosenthal have addressed many of the questions that I had about PSC, but particularly about Hunter College High School. They get $19.8 million. They have an abysmal 2% black students, I believe it is, and 6% uh, low income students. That's unacceptable. And as we're talking about transparency, we have not gotten anything that we can write on paper or refer to that says who in fact has the authority, what is the governance plan, what are the protocols for setting the admission policy at Hunter College High School. So I'll pose that question to you. Who determines the admission policy for Hunter College High School. We're in, a, we're in a pandemic. Pandemic is telling us about all of the uh, inequity that has been surfaced. We have an opportunity now, as Dr. Martin Luther King says, you have an opportunity to make a difference, to stand up and say something, as Shirley Chisholm said, speak up. What is, what is Hunter College high school going to do? We had a hearing and didn't get a definitive answer. What is going to be, it's already March and they haven't said what their plan is for admission. So that adds to the anxiety of students who want to avail themselves of getting into Hunter College High School. And, and mostly uh, more, stem, more systemic to me and undergirding is that who makes the decision? Who determines? No one has been able to definitively say that. And it's been a question that's been asked for more than a year. So do you have the answer? It's the, 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 the Is it the president in conjunction with? Is it the chancellor? Is it the chancellor in conjunction with? Is it the board of trustees? Who does that? The last time that it might've been changed, who made that change? Who made that decision? Uh, the president of Hunter College is the one who, um, Makes, makes the decision and in consultation with the chancellor. Finally, it's taken us all this time to get that answer. Thank you so much. And, and in the discussions that we have with the students, they really didn't feel that uh, they were being heard and responded to by president uh, of Hunter and they expressed their displeasure in that. But I think what uh, my colleague has said about being definitive and being clear is uh, important as we get to the budget process to make sure that we continue the great work that Hunter College High School does and that we have it accessible to a wider population of the students who live in New York City. Thank you. Madam uh, moderator, you can continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, seeing no other council members, and I believe, Chair, are you, are you done with your additional questioning? Because I can now turn it over to the next panel. Uh, no, I can. I'm, I have lots more questions. All right. Well, as there are no other council members, my colleagues, I didn't want them to not be able to get their questions in. 
All right. Okay. It does not appear that we have any other council members waiting to ask questions. I'll take a minute just to give them a chance to raise their hand on Zoom, if so. Okay. All right, then we can turn back to you, Chair Barron, to ask your additional questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, in terms of PSC, CUNY had recently decided to withhold 2% pay increase to members of the Professional Staff Congress that was due in November, 2020. And then the chancellor stated that this was merely a delay, but CUNY has not presented its plan to implement this raise. And this delay impacts over 28,000 members of PSC and a total contract value of $44 million annually. Similarly, CUNY is delaying equity pay increases of $1,000 impacting 1,295 PSC members scheduled to have been implemented on February 11th, 2021. My question is what is the status of these contract issues with PSC? We heard recently that this may have been resolved, but we want to have it on the record so that we will know what is the status. Sure, on, on, the, on the equity uh, piece, uh, I believe that an agreement has been reached with uh, both the PSC uh, on, uh, on those payments uh, with the chancellor. Um, and we're, we're in the process of uh, moving forward uh, with, with that. Uh, on the on the PSC, you know, as we um, it continues to be delayed uh, until we uh, our budget our budget um, picture is we have a better sense of our budget uh, situation once we we sort of uh, hear from our funding partners at the state in the city, then uh, we'll be able to um, to really um, be able to address that. As, as my colleague Mass Appiens has stated, um, the chancellor was extremely proud of, of working with the PSC on this contract. It is something that um, we, uh, we, we spend a lot of time with the PSC negotiating and we're very proud to be able to give our very important uh, faculty members uh, that this contract, um, this pandemic has caused all kinds of challenges uh, to the university, which we, we've talked about at length uh, at this hearing. Um, but we will continue to um, make sure that uh, we honor that contract once we are able to um, have complete clarity on our budget situation. Thank you. Uh, I have about perhaps another 30 minutes worth of questions. So do you want to take a break for five minutes and come back? Or do you want to continue? We're good. Okay, great. Then we'll continue. We'll continue. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you were good. Well, thank you so much, Council. Is, is CUNY considering a tuition increase in the fall? Right now, we we uh, we have uh, right now. We, as as you know, we didn't make a we didn't make a tuition increase this year. Right, and right now, we are not. Um, we haven't made those determinations on on the fall. Thank you. As as we look at our budget situation, we'll know better. Okay, uh, you, I'm sure, are aware that there's legislation. Senate Bill 4461, a new deal for CUNY. And this is a proposal that would waive all tuition and establish certain staff to student ratio to improve success of students. Uh, and there's no time restriction on students to complete their degree. There would be a gradual escalation of mental health and other counselors to align with, with national standards are because the national standards are, are much higher than what CUNY is presently implementing. And there would also be increased investments for critical updates to CUNY, CUNY facilities going as high as um, uh, 
6.5 per thousand students, I believe, in the year 2026. And they would increase the ratio for students, for faculty to students over also a five year period. What's CUNY's position on this plan? We are, we, is it, we allow, we, we, we let our a legislative body and uh, council body sort of make those determinations on how we get the resources. And obviously as a university, uh, we're always supportive of resources that, um, that will come our way. Um, but um, we, we allow you folks that uh, sort of are empowered to make those decisions, to, to make those decisions and advocate for those, for those decisions uh, as a university. We are always um, open to uh, receiving more resources. Good answer, good answer. <laughs> CUNY has a total proposed budget of 1.17 billion for, or approximately 1.2 billion for fiscal 2022, all of which is still organized in three broad categories or paired units of appropriation. But 94% of all of that money falls into one of three pairs supporting the community colleges. The council has brought this to uh, CUNY's attention several times over the years already. How was the conversation with the Office of Management and Budget uh, about re restructuring funding for the community colleges into more units of appropriation going? When uh, Director Chia was here yesterday, he was quite open, that's what he said on the record, to establishing more units of appropriation. And again, what we're trying to get at is greater transparency and an easier ability to track how this money is being distributed and where it's going. Matt? So Chair Barron, we, we have had discussions with the Office of Management and Budget about this issue. And I think we're, we're really at the, at the place now of um, getting together with both CUNY, the Office of Management and Budget and council finance staff so that we can um, make determinations together as a group between those three entities about what's the best way to address the issues that you've raised and, and make sure that everyone feels that the structure is transparent. You know, this is this is the city's budget structure. It's something we can't do on our own, as you pointed out. We need, right. um, you know, our partners to do that. So I'm happy to take the lead in scheduling that meeting with council, finance staff, and and my team, and and the office management and but the you know the appropriate people at the office management and budget, so that we can begin to work collaboratively on on uh, taking a uh, you know a deeper look at this. That's great uh, because it will help us. It will enhance our. Uh, ability to see what's happening. And my proposal would be that we could look to see what each community college has so that there would be uh, clear lines defining where the appropriations are going for each of the uh, seven community colleges. So we can start those meetings next week. And by the time the budget is done in June, we'll be able to satisfy what everybody acknowledges is an important move. Uh, of the 1.1 billion for community colleges, 376.3 million or 34% is not directly assigned to an individual college. It's categorized into central administration and a variety of miscellaneous buckets. If there are more units of appropriation or a pair for each of the seven community colleges, then adequate transparency for clear oversight by either the council or the general public would occur. So how is this 376.3 million in funding used over the course of a year? So a lot of it, um, there, there are um, expenses that the university incurs and administers centrally on behalf of the campuses. So things, the biggest components are things like fringe benefit costs, um, and energy costs, the, the colleges aren't going out and, and cutting checks for um, the, the health insurance for their employees or for the heat light and power of their campuses. The university does that centrally and, and it's a good shared service for the university to do it that way. 
and create efficiencies rather than the campuses do it. So the majority are that. Um, as you mentioned earlier in the hearing chair, Baron, uh, about our intracity city program, you, you had referenced this early in your remarks. Um, the, the other big component is we do a lot of intracity city um, business <laughs> um, because we are a university and a lot, of, a lot of other agencies reach out to us for help. Um, and so we usually do around $100 million worth of intracity city revenue. And so a lot of that um, is, is administered centrally too. There are some um, there are some intercity agreements that specific colleges have with specific city agencies, but a lot of that goes through the central bucket too. So we're happy to um, to provide a further breakdown of of those funds and and how they end up getting distributed throughout the year and, and what costs they cover. Um, but the, but those are the major ones that um, that the ones that I, I just mentioned. That that would be very helpful for us to have a breakout. And how is each community college's budget determined? And what are the determinant factors used? Is it the number of teachers, the staff, class size, student population? It's mainly enrollment. Um, it's not a hundred percent of enrollment, but we do have a community college funding model um, that we use that determines the majority of the funding that the colleges get. And it's mainly based on enrollment changes. Um, there is some fixed funding that colleges receive for, for different types of costs and different types of programs that are outside of the model. But the model is mainly predicated on the enrollment um, levels that the colleges have. So enrollment is, is uh, really important, um, not only obviously because our mission for our community college especially is access, and we wanna serve as many students that, that wanna come, but for funding determinations at the community college, enrollment is, is, is the key driver. The, the PMMR tells us that uh, the average cost to instruct a community college student is $16,664 from fiscal 2020. Is that the same cost across each community college? And if not, can we be provided with the cost per community college to instruct a student? Sure. Yeah, we're happy to provide that. And, and it's not the same and, and really is because of scale and and. What I mean by that is a community college like Hostos um, in the Bronx um, that has, I believe, around six or 7,000 students, um, their cost per FTE is gonna be a lot more than BMCC that has over 20,000 students um, because each college has a president and a provost and a bursar and they all have those kind of fixed costs. Um, so the smaller colleges um, will, um, typically will have a higher per student cost than, than the larger colleges, um, but we're happy to provide those numbers. And what is the average cost to instruct a Hunter College campus student in the high school and in the elementary school? Yeah, I, I don't have that number. I, I'm sorry, Chair Brown, I don't have that with me, but it's certainly a knowable number. And so um, we'll work with the college and make sure that we get you and the rest of the committee those that data quickly. Thank you so much. And so my last uh, category of questions or next to last, talking about CUNY's preliminary capital commitment plan. The fiscal 2021 through 2025 preliminary capital commitment plan remained relatively flat, slight, uh, slightly by compared to the adopted capital plan totaling $629.7 million. Have all of CUNY's projects resumed since the pause? Uh, yes, they have. Um, I'm happy to report they all have resumed. Um, and um, during, the, during the pause, the, the projects that were, uh, as I stated in my opening remarks, were really um, those that, that, that were connected to safety and health. Um, but now all the additional projects have, have are be, move, beginning to move forward. Uh, how many stopped work and how many now have resumed? Do you have that number? We could get that to you. Okay. And of the total 135 projects included in the fiscal 2021 through 2025 capital commitment plan, uh, how many of them are, are we looking at? How many of them included? You have 136 total projects? Right. And they're at various stages in the capital plan from 
2021? Yeah, it depends on, um, you know, the, the projects are broken up in a couple of different categories. If they're being funded by an individual council member or borough president, as you know, we're not allowed to, to, uh, to move project along until we have sort of the, the full right. funding. And then we have to get the state uh, matching fund in order to be allowed to move forward, right? So that's on, on those kind of projects. On, on projects that are being funded by, by the state, you know, those projects are, you know, obviously uh, moving forward um, through, through our, um, for the most part, all of those projects that you mentioned, 135, they're all in different phases of design and uh, construction and um, in some cases uh, completion, as I stated, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the city college daycare center, the Phoenix in the Heights, uh, a couple of other projects are sort of in the, so in, they're in different phases of, of, um, of what, you know, in terms of the project in different phases. Of the 135 projects, how many of them are new that are included in this plan for 21 through 25? Um, I have to get you that information unless when you have, do you have that one? She's, uh, she's muted. I, I think we'll have to get that information. We'll get you that information. Thank you. And how many projects does CUNY anticipate completing this fiscal year? Um, I think, I think is, is, uh, when it has those numbers, but she's muted. Um, I think it's about, when it's about 30 or so that are going to be completed. Um, yeah, about 30, 30. that will be completed. But we're happy to let me make sure that I get you the, the right number count for him because I'm um, sort of sort of remember that number, but uh, I believe it's about 30. And um, then how many new projects did you start this fiscal year from the uh, previous block of time? All of that is, I think we I think, as you know, since we were stopped, not a lot. OK, um, so mm -hmm. we will but we are beginning that process again. And I believe we sent you um, 28 community college projects that we anticipate yes. completing this year. 28 so, completing this year, okay. So I was close. You were, but, but calendar, I didn't do it fiscal. And, and, a lot of, and a lot of it had to do with, you know, there's an additional COVID-19 protocols. As you know, we, as a campus, um, every campus, we can't exceed 5% um, in terms of cases or 100. And so sometimes we've had cases where we had some of the dormitory authority workers have been tested positive to COVID. And so that's created sort of delays and all kinds of challenges. But uh, we've, we since then have made some additional safety protocols that allows us to move some of those projects uh, forward. What's the average time frame that it takes to complete a project? And what are the factors that impact the length of time that it takes? Well, a lot of factors, right? First of all, if we have, if we have all of the funding in place, right? Um, you know, because we're a public entity, we have to go out and uh, work with the dormitory authority to make sure that they, they get the bids. Um, you know, there is, uh, so on any particular project, depending on the scope of the project, it could take as much as, if it's, a, if it's a new building, it could take as much as three years. If it's a rehab building, it could take about a year and a half uh, to two. If it's, you know, smaller projects like, you know, bathrooms and things like that, you know, we could do those in, a, in, a, in about a year. Um, I think the challenge for us always is that, you know, even though we have a great partner with the dormitory authority, you know, we do have to be put in the queue. I mean, they do have, they do uh, provide the same services to SUNY and, so we, we try to, and then we're, we're also bound by making sure that we have all the funding in place before uh, we're allowed to go forward. So there's a lot of factors, but anywhere from a year to, to, to three years, depending on the project. Uh, thank you. Uh, CUNY relies on a hundred buildings to support students across its seven community colleges. And as has been stated earlier in this hearing, the average age of these buildings is more than 50 years while many buildings are closer to 100 years old. Of the total number of buildings among the CUNY campuses, how many include capital projects that are underway? And how many more are planning phase for capital construction? Um, 
When do you have that number? I will, we'll, we'll provide you that number uh, of the uh, I think she's community. Good. Yeah, we can unmute Gwen, that would be great. <laughs> we could keep her on mute, that would be helpful. That, I don't. Sorry about that. Um, okay. I don't have it by building, but we will provide that to you. I mean, I, there's a lot of work going on, so it's gonna be, you'll be pleased with the numbers, but we'll provide that to you. And, and I would say this, that um, one, of the, one of the priorities that the council has made is that projects that have to do with uh, air filtration, ventilation, uh, HAVC, all those kind of projects have been sort of been um, kicked up to the top to make sure that those projects are, are, are completed. And we've, we've had a couple of those projects um, uh, completed uh, recently, and we'll continue to move those projects open. And, and I'll view those are projects that are extremely important um, in this pandemic. Uh, thank you. And my last two questions, what is the total value of all of the community college assets? And has this value changed since the pandemic? Um, we're, we're doing an analysis now to see, right? Um, so I can, I can uh, give you that number. Um, and I won't speculate to try to give you that number. Uh, as I stated earlier, we're, we're looking at all our, all our real estate to, to, to determine, you know, best use um, that, uh, number one, uh, first serves our mission. Number two, service our mission. And number three, uh, can, there be, can there be some, some uh, uh, revenues connected to it? So I think that um, uh, we'll know more, um, hopefully by the end of, uh, by the end of this year, this calendar year, because we have uh, brought in someone to sort of look at and, and take a look at all our sort of our real estate. And, and finally, uh, there are many city agencies that have a history of front loading their capital commitment plans and CUNY is amongst the, those agencies. In addition to creating gross disparities between the amount of funding allocated in a given year and the amount that CUNY can realistically commit this practice eliminates any ability for the council to get an adequate sense of how long individual projects will actually take to complete. So although CUNY's commitment rate has markedly improved before COVID, COVID are there additional steps being taken to continue to prepare realistically and spend down as planned and budgeted? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. One of the things that's gonna help that is I don't wanna be an acting a vice chancellor for facilities. I just, I like to be COO. So we're in the process, the chancellor's in the process of making, uh, finalizing, hiring a, a vice chancellor for facilities. So that will go a long way to make sure that I have a, a dedicated person managing the 80 plus staff that are uh, at CUNY. One of the other things that the chancellor has made it very clear to me as the COO that, you know, we need to become a little, we need to become more uh, efficient and, and frankly, uh, Councilwoman, even though we have improved from 20 something percent and 30 percent to 40 something percent in terms of completion, that's unacceptable, right? We need to do better, right? So one of the things that the Chancellor has charged us with is, is making sure that our completion rate um, in, increases because I think your point is well taken. Uh, it is you as council members have allocated very important resources to us and it's up to us to make sure that we not only um, account for those resources, but make sure that we, 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 we use those resources appropriately and, and, and complete those projects in an appropriate time. So I am committed to um, making sure that going forward and, and I'm, I'm hope next year when, I'm, when we're in front of you, we'll be able to give you a much better number or you'll be able to report that the numbers are much better. But I think that one of the charges of the new vice chancellor facilities is to improve that. And so we're gonna be looking at how we're structure and try to see what additional staffing we might need to control some of our own destiny and make sure that we can move some projects along. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I am term limited, so I won't be here, but I'm sure that whoever uh, comes behind and has this position will expect that you'll be able to have that continuity and be able to share that information with the council body. I wanna thank you and I just wanna say, Dr. Martin Luther King said that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And for me, that means we've got to make sure that when we come through this 
pandemic on the other side and when we look at what we have newly created to bring true justice and equity to all of our persons and citizens and residents who are living here, that we want to be able to say that CUNY played a significant role in that. We want to be able to say, yes, Black and Brown and Latinx people have in fact been able to move through the ranks and uh, are serving significantly in those positions of upper management and that the students who have come through have not been unduly burdened with finances because we know that uh, the, the governor's Excelsior program is last dollar in and it doesn't benefit. I don't think any uh, community college students got any grant through the Excelsior program. So we wanna make sure that when we come through this and we look at what we have put in place as new programs that we can be proud of what we've done and we can say, look what we've started, look what we're doing, and make sure that we continue to move forward with that basis of equity. I wanna thank you for, for your patience, for your questions, for answering the questions that have been posed to you and uh, give my regards to all of those who are making this happen. Thank you. Councilwoman, uh, I wanna thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify for your commitment to CUNY. Our chancellor is extremely committed to those same words that you just laid out. And um, we are uh, very grateful for your, your, your continued support and, um, and, and, and the support of this council. Okay. So thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. Uh, I'm frozen. Hands up, sick. All right. All right, thank you, Chair Barron. It looks like you're frozen. Hopefully that's just not me on my end. I've been having some technical difficulties as well, but we have concluded our testimony from the administration. So we would like to turn to the rest of public testimony now. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call an up individuals in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few second delay that when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. And the first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Barbara Bowen and Andrea Vasquez. I will now call on Barbara Bowen to testify. Your time Great. will begin now. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Barron. Thank you, members of the council. Uh, for your wonderful questions and incisive comments today um, and for your advocacy in this incredibly difficult year. Um, the union is calling for a fundamentally different approach from the one you heard from CUNY. We are calling on you not just to maintain the status quo or return CUNY to quote, pre-pandemic normal, but we are calling on you, and I heard this from some of you, to recognize that this is the year in which the working people of New York, the people of color of New York, the immigrants of New York need CUNY more than ever. And therefore, this is the year in which New York must invest in CUNY and invest its way out of this crisis. Maintaining the old normal will maintain a normal that was killing people, literally people of color, and was crushing CUNY. And so we are calling for new investment. Um, I also want to uh, come back to some of the questions from earlier, but let me say a little bit about why the new investment is so important. Um, we've heard about the importance of CUNY in this year of COVID um, and the impact uh, on the city has been unspeakable really and has hit the communities of color the hardest. Um, and just to give a sense of the kind of budget address that CUNY could make, the kind of budget intervention that the council um, could make by investing in CUNY, uh, we should take a look at the uh, report that recently came out for the Center for an Urban Future. And they showed really shocking racial and ethnic disparities in higher education attainment. Just as one snippet, 20% uh, of Latinx New Yorkers, 27% of Black New Yorkers, 45% of Asian New Yorkers hold a bachelor's degree compared to 64% of white New Yorkers 
So the gap between Latinos and white New Yorkers, non-Latino white New Yorkers is from 20% to 64%. The disparities are even more shocking within neighborhoods. CUNY, and that's so critical at this moment when the um, economy is becoming increasingly bifurcated and jobs that require a college credential will be more important than ever. So investment in CUNY is a critical way to address that. We are calling you from the PSC to invest 77 million to reverse the cuts from this year's enacted budget and the quote cost efficiencies in the mayor's preliminary budget for 2022. There is nothing efficient about undermining the ability of the public university to sustain and support the people of New York. Second, we're calling on you for 24 million to provide revenue to offset the loss of tuition from the enrollment declines you heard about. It's not enough just to uh, keep the community college funding from the state, there must be this offset. And finally, we're calling on you for an additional 21 million or about 20 million to invest in the first- Your time year. has expired. Uh, okay, thank you. If I could just finish, finish my yes, sentence. Yes, you can continue. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. To invest in the first year of the New Deal for CUNY. Chancellor member, uh, Council member and Leader Barron uh, spoke about that and spoke about the legislation. I was disappointed that the CUNY administration didn't jump up and say, yes, we will work for that. That legislation, which has been introduced in Albany, is a bold plan, a visionary plan for new investment. And it provides for free tuition throughout CUNY, for a restoration of a staffing ratio between full-time faculty, uh, full-time mental health counselors, full-time academic advisors and students. It professionalizes adjunct compensation and it provides for capital funding. It rep represents a student, faculty, labor, community coalition to reimagine what CUNY should be. Um, so we call on you in the city to take that step this year, make this the year in which you put in new investment and do the city's part for the first year toward a new deal for CUNY. So that represents a total of 121.5 million that we are calling for, which as I said, represents a different direction from CUNY, calls on you to use this as the year for a visionary and bold investment. And finally, I'll just mention two things and then I'll stop um, and Andrea Vasquez will join me in any questions. Um, we heard, and I was delighted to hear that uh, council member Lander spoke about the proposal for pilot funding, a payment in lieu of taxes. Um, the PSC has advanced that idea. I was surprised that the CUNY administration said they weren't familiar with it, um, but we have testified in front of city tax commissions on that issue, and I'm looking forward to sending you our testimony. And then finally, uh, Council Member Barron, you asked um, uh, about the, um, the commitment of CUNY to anti-racism, and I want to say two things there. Um, I was very pleased to hear the comments they made about anti-racism, but I want to say first that without a significant new and different investment in CUNY. New York's recovery, whatever recovery there is, will be partial and I would say it will be racist because it will reinscribe the, the inequities of race and class that were horribly exposed by this pandemic. And that's why we feel it's incumbent on the city to make a different kind of investment, a different level investment and go beyond simply restoring funds that were cut. It, it makes no sense to cut, but it, it makes great sense to do more. Um, and just one last mention, uh, Council Member Barron, you asked about the raises that have been withheld from the people who work at CUNY, the working faculty and staff, and then the equity raise that we had negotiated specifically to address gaps in salary and also to uh, address the inequities in salary for uh, categories of workers that include large numbers of women and people of color. And uh, the um, administration of CUNY said that those raises had been restored. It's worth saying that we had to fight tooth and nail to get them restored. I'm very pleased they were, but we were demonstrating, petitioning, uh, sending car caravans, sending thousands of emails just to get that raise restored. So I would, um, I commend you for asking about that. and call on CUNY to maintain a commitment to its faculty and staff, including its adjunct faculty, still have not been restored to those positions. And above all, thank the members of the council for your continued support, your 
uh, incisive questioning, your precision about what is needed at CUNY, and your willingness to go with us to imagine a different future for CUNY at this moment when CUNY is needed by New York City more than perhaps any time in its history. We're asking the city, unlike the university administration, we and the people of New York are asking for the investment CUNY needs. So thank you very much, and we'd be delighted to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Excuse me for not being on video, but my connection was unstable. And I was told that if you go off video, that helps to stabilize it. But I heard everything that you said. Thank, um, you. Yes, thank you so much. That makes so much sense. If we know what the conditions were prior to the pandemic, and we know that those conditions were inequitable and oppressive, if you just bring back the same levels of what was existing before the pandemic, you're going to have the same situation. If you want to have change, you've got to make an investment in that and make sure that that money and the programs and the foresight and the planning and all of those partners that you mentioned, that they're all involved in that to in fact make a difference. It, you can't make the difference without the financial capital investment in that. And, and that's so very clear. And uh, the way that you presented it just highlighted it. You know, we have to have more money. We can't just restore. We've got to have more money to move forward. And in terms of um, the comments that you made about the pilot, I was also surprised that they said that they weren't familiar with it. Not that I knew that you had had testimony before that, uh, before the council on that issue, but simply being on the edge of what's going on in higher education, it perhaps should have come across your radar at some point, even if you weren't uh, at that point actively pursuing that. And in terms of the adjuncts, I think that my colleague, uh, Council Member Lander was very clear. Wait, you still got $93 million and to bring back those whose jobs were not given can be a part of that because in fact, the protection, the PPE talks about keeping, employee, and keeping employees working, keeping them in, in that uh, mainframe and keeping them in that environment. So we didn't get a definitive answer on that. And, and the, the nebulous answer to uh, supporting the New Deal for CUNY, since he didn't say no, and since he thinks all measures are great, then he supports the plan. And that's how I'm presenting that and projecting that. You didn't say you objected. You didn't say it was bad. You said that's a legislative matter. So we're glad that you're supporting our efforts in that regard. But I wanna thank you and commend uh, all of the members for the great work that they do. And we're gonna to continue to uh, make sure that all of these issues are addressed, responded, and that we move forward and, Again, thank you for the work that you do and the sacrifices that you make. Thank you, council member. And if I, I think Andrea wants to say that, I just wanted to say one quick thing about the adjuncts. And, and I was so um, pleased that council member Rosenthal and council member uh, Lander raised that and that you just said that too. But sorry, when you said at the end that, that you were term limited, we knew that and that future hearings, it won't be you. But uh, I, I also want the chance to say um, how fabulous uh, your leadership and questioning has been. Uh, I, we are all grateful Appreciate. for that. Absolutely. And just to add on the adjuncts, the, um, the language in the, I mean, I think the, the point that was made was very clear. The idea of those stimulus bills, the primary idea was that one way the economy survives and people survive is that businesses, nonprofits, schools, higher education institutions should keep people on payroll. And that language is the same language in the CARES Act and in the second stimulus that provides 455 million to CUNY. So, uh, and the adjuncts, there were initially 2,900 adjuncts laid off by CUNY. Almost a thousand were restored through the efforts of those adjuncts themselves, the union, the department chairs who fought for them. I think there were 100 and some, 30 some through the Mellon funding. Again, we made that an issue and I'm very pleased that the chancellor did uh, reinstate those 130, um, but there's still nearly 2000 who have lost their CUNY income. And that should be a priority 
in the spending and to hold on to the CARES Act funding uh, and as new money is coming in right. and not use it to restore people to payroll when the fundamental thrust of that federal stimulus was keep people on payroll, it is unconscionable. So to hear the administration say we value our adjuncts highly and then, oh, but they're disposable when CUNY wants to make a cut is not an acceptable answer. And I really commend the council for focusing on that and uh, requiring that CUNY provide uh, an accounting of how that money has been spent and how it should be dedicated before some other needs to putting people back on payroll. So thank you for that. And I think Andrea wanted to say something. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Andrea Vasquez. Thank you. Um, this is not formal testimony, but I, I, um, I'm happy to be here and I want to thank Chair Barron for her incredible um, strong questioning of CUNY and running of this hearing. This is so important that we're all here. Um, I did want to pick up because I am, and I apologize for having to jump off briefly, but there was something else I had to be at. But um, I guess I wanted to reemphasize that this problem of the way CUNY presents what they're doing. And what was so stunning to me was um, one of the things when Chair Barron asked the very good question about not only funding of ASAP, but what does it mean for the quality of ASAP? Um, um, uh, Chief Finance Officer uh, Matt, uh, Matt Sapienza said, I believe it's still good. I believe it's still good. I believe the quality is still up to snuff. Well, it simply isn't. And we know that. And I'm a professional staff member myself, so I hear from our 5,100 people. And I actually even texted um, a, 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 a director of counseling at one of the colleges and a director of ASAP at a different college. And, you know, it's just not okay to just say, I feel quality is the same when we know that students are suffering because of the, the, the options and the, um, the time that staff as well as faculty. We often talk about faculty, but these uh, cuts have affected staff where staff are being asked to do one and two, three jobs instead of one and students suffer. You know, they, their work life suffers as well, but students suffer. And we can't just say, um, I think the quality is okay because it isn't. In, um, and um, in, the, in the area of ASAP, they, you know, ASAP was doing a great job. It got so uh, renowned nationally. Um, they, they, they expanded pre-COVID, they expanded and the offerings diminished. What students got became less. Now, after COVID, students are struggling so much that they're actually not in the program. Their, their numbers are dwindling, but, and, you know, but that's not a good thing. The, actually, the advisors in ASAP are, are trying so hard to maintain that 50% graduation rate that they had achieved prior to COVID. Um, so, you know, where are they headed? Is, you just ask yourself, where are they headed? Um, this cheapening of, in, in so many ways, just uh, cannot continue. And um, so that was ASAP. The, in terms of mental health counselors, we often hear about CUNY providing money for mental health. Well, what CUNY did since COVID is to throw a, a, a one-time amount of money to the colleges. I think each college got, I don't know, a couple of hundred million or something. Uh, I'm not sure I could look it up. But they had to spend it, they had to hire in the fall, and it had to all be spent by, by the end of the fiscal year. How are you going to work with students on mental health issues by bringing in part-time temp workers that are running into an office and running out, not knowing anything about CUNY necessarily, anything about the student body, and they don't have a, an assured job. They certainly can't learn, have time to learn and build a relationship to be really good mental health counselors. So we, everybody's talking about mental health right now, and it's going to be so needed in the years that the time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll leave it at that. We need more than, than a one-shot cheaping <laughs> support. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you for your testimony. And again, I apologize, for going, I apologize for going off camera, but I'm trying to get a more stable connection. So yeah. I heard you. I didn't, <laughs> didn't see me, but I heard you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, um, I'd like to turn it over to Chair Barron if you have any questions. And also I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom if they have any questions for this panel. Chair Barron. Well, no, I don't have any further uh, comments or questions. Just want to encourage you to continue to do the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. 
um, seeing as we have no other questions from the chair or from any other council members, um, we have, I believe we have heard from everyone who has signed up to testify. Uh, we appreciate your time and your presence here today. If we've inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raised hand function um, and we'll call you. Looks like we've done that. And if you, I would also like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Barron, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you so much. I want to thank our moderator, our council, Amy Briggs. I want to thank all of the people who helped to do all the research and get me all the notes to be able to pose those pointed questions. I want to thank the behind the scenes persons. I want to thank the sergeants at arm and everyone who had anything to do with bringing this uh, hearing to, to a successful event. And with that, we are concluded and this hearing is adjourned and I'm going to use my shake away knowing mm -hmm. that my mute is on this time. Thank you so much.